Today's episode is with John Dixon. John is a long-term CEO and veteran not only of the U.S. Air Force, but also of the information security industry. I don't know which is more difficult on a guy, to be honest. We talk a lot about his time in the Air Force, picking bomb targets in the Gulf War, and what life was like during that time. We also dig into what has changed about the information security space over the last 20 to 30 years. We also spend quite a bit of time talking about attacks on SCADA systems and what critical infrastructure in the U.S. is going to look like if we do get hit. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with John Dixon. Yeah, this, this is our seventh season, man. We learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, a lot of very hard-earned wisdom. So I'm impressed. I appreciate that. I knew you way back when, when you were yeah, just Okay, like, so funny you mentioned that. I was trying to figure this out because um, I think you were thinking we met at White Hat, but I, that's not. It was way before that. I don't know. It was way before that. I mean, that's the, the, the joy and sadness of being older. It's like you know people, you don't really know from where and how no. and how long. So, <laughs> so I don't remember where or from, but I feel like I definitely met you at the first World OWASP conference. I think that. At, the, at least then. The one in New York. like No, on, no, no. That was like the second one or third okay. one or something. No, no, the one that was in San Jose, California. Yeah, I was at that one. That was the very first yeah, one. Yeah, me and Dan didn't yeah. know what we were doing. Yeah, and I already knew you by then. Okay. So I, it must have, this is way longer than White Hat. That's, I don't that's know. It's like almost a decade I mean, like I, I at White Hat. I, one, a funny story, this is, all, I guess, on background. I uh, downloaded all my LinkedIn contacts, which I don't recommend you do. It's like 6,000-ish. <laughs> and one of the cool things is it does give you a quick date stamp of when you became Friends. friends with that person oh. so i can go actually look and find out and that'll be a little bit of a forensics thing to go back yeah uh, but i don't th- man this might a- even predate linkedin or just or right on it's the like edge. 2005 2006 so you're right no i agree it's kind of there that's a you know great problem to have yeah. you know, realizing like i've known you that long and others uh, I, no i mean maybe even almost a full decade before then uh I, i'm most certain we crossed paths I, w- I would say this the first Black Hat I went to was probably 98, 99, first RSA, somewhere after that. And so, yeah, I mean, like, that I don't know. And there's certain right. people that I know. Uh, I also, and we'll talk about this, maybe the the Trident Data Systems guys, the pen test team were like deep community guys, mm-hmm. as they say. Mm-hmm. So they knew everybody. And mm-hmm. that's probably where, you know, I think I, I mentioned that in the notes, but yeah. they, they were, you know, the first Black Hat DEF CON Everyone knew them and nobody knew me. Mm-hmm. I was like, how do you know everybody? <laughs> <laughs> they all had handles. I didn't have a uh-huh, handle. Uh-huh. That's, that's where I got the cute handle, Fungo. A fungo. 1997, 98 or whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel like I feel like I knew you w- like way before Denim Group for sure. Yeah. Um, but I don't remember exactly how but also there's a lot of like uh, industry parties that happen so oh, like, yeah so i'd run into a lot of people and not necessarily know how i know them exactly it's like oh i see them this is the fourth fifth time i've seen them sixth time i've seen them and now we're like we're talking and i recognize them and we've hanging out a bunch of times and you know what i mean so like like adam shostak and adam i know shostak, each yeah. other from i think trident but we can't figure it out so like 97 96 right. maybe earlier and so there, that happens. That's a cool problem to have. Like you, yeah. you've known each other for so long that you just simply don't remember anymore how mm-hmm. you know each other. So that's kind of uh, just kind of a funny story. I was uh, talking with uh, a bunch of random people from my perspective. I didn't really know who they were at uh, DEF CON years and years and years ago. And I was saying, I'm never going back to, to DEF CON ag- or uh, yeah, no, no, I'm never going back to Black Hat again is what I was saying. Um, yeah, I was a waste of my time, blah, 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 blah. blah. And they were like, all these people kind of like, <gasps> like doing one of these to me. We were at DEF CON at the time. I'm like, why is everyone being so weird? And then they're like, well, okay. So anyway, have you met Ping? <laughs> and she's like one of the one of the people who ran the co- the conference. And I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> I really just totally put my foot all the way yeah, in my mouth. Yeah. And what I, uh, meant, what I meant to say, no, was- no, yeah, yeah. At that point, you're already kind of outed. So I'm like, okay, here's my actual beef. And I started telling her all the things I thought was wrong. Oh yeah. And uh, and then the very next year, she's like, you really need to be on our advisory committee. And, you know, like Here we are. yeah. So I uh, I was going to tell you, I I I don't think I mentioned this. I got spotted as a fed air force guy so kind of a fed not i mean like not really and i was actually an air force reservist fed so like like 
is in the pantheon of of feds it's like kind of low i would i would say very low uh, <laughs> but but it was a guy named cypher that was his handle older uh-huh. guy they came up to me and said hey do you mind if i spot you this is you know like okay because because i want the t-shirt you get one too and i was like so i got pulled up on stage it's a cool uh, shirt to have it's a cool shirt i have no idea where it is anymore but a priest was the guy that i yeah. was up there priest, and yeah. i said oh i'm from san antonio and i'm at the Inf- air force information warfare center and he said this is at the time he said offense or defense and then that's when i shut down <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like offense or defense was like nope i'm gonna say that uh but so yeah i've been in in, in it for i guess 20 plus 23 24 years so yeah no, it's got to be more than that. If, I, by I, that math, it's got to be more than that, man. Yeah, that's okay. Good problem yeah. to have. Yeah, 20, 20 28 I'm, is my guess. Somewhere around there. Yeah. So, okay, you, uh, you talked about the Air Force. Why don't we kind of talk about your background and like how you kind of came up? So let's let's start yeah. with your, uh, your military days. So ex-Air Force intelligence officer, SIGINT guy. Uh, so I worked in that community and uh, – it was a fun job. I'll just say that. I can say this now, but I couldn't say it then. I work with the U-2 in Korea. Mm-hmm. It's my first job as a second lieutenant. Phenomenal mission. Phenomenal job. Uh, a cool and then, plan. Uh, you know, it's still still there. Mm-hmm. Been there for 50-ish years. Uh, went back to San Antonio. Was at Kelly Air Force Base in what was then the Air Force Electronic Warfare Center. Back, uh, And I got deployed right away uh, to Operation Desert Shield at the time. And I was part of a group that did... Uh, essentially electronic warfare consulting to the air force out there. You know, we were like a specialty component that would go add on uh, during wartime. We had a group down in Riyadh. I was in Insulik, Turkey, and we were responsible for everything north of the 32nd parallel, which is ironically Tikrit, which is where Saddam Hussein Mm. was from. Mm -hmm. Everything north of that our base had. Uh, It was Pretty interesting and overwhelming for, I think it was mid twenties. Uh, I, the story that I remember, we, we, we had to do what's called target nomination, nominating targets for command and control targets, which are C3, uh, telephone switching centers, fiber optic plants. And our moment. And, of, and, and also direct military targets, I would assume, right? Or uh, well, what, what they did, uh, in, uh so essentially, th- there are specialists that specialize in different types of targets uh-huh, behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And one of the target classes or types is called command and control, C3. And that's what we were responsible for helping, amongst other things, nominating targets. Mm-hmm. And that kind of started out informally. And they recognized where we were at in Turkey. There weren't other experts. So we kind of be- became the de facto experts at it. And we did something called nodal analysis to find out where the key nodes were and where all the you know, message traffic went through or comms went through. And the gist of what we're supposed to do is to essentially recommend targets to be destroyed in order to force the Iraqis up to communicate on airwaves, which we could either intercept or jam. Mm-hmm. Uh, the interesting thing was it was myself and a handful of very, very young airmen, a couple of few officers and airmen, and we would nominate these targets and send them to the what's called Air Operations Center and they would put them in the daily, you know, we knew the process was working. They would put these in the daily missions, but we didn't really, we, we knew it conceptually, right? And we, there was one day, about a week into it, I go to the Air Operations Center and I see all the targets nominated by class. There's, there's the command and control ones. And I looked at the list that I had submitted three days before and it was the same list. Wow. And I was like... Oh man, oh man, <laughs> and I mean, I think again, this is I why was, they blindfold the uh, the shooters when they're going to go uh, put, uh, put someone to death, kind of thing. So you don't know if you're the one who shot them, <laughs> and or like the blanks and the gun, like three guys have blanks and one guy well, has that, the, that the real too. thing, you know. Uh, and, and I and I also was very aware from a from that the impact, and I knew that it wasn't it was very serious. This wasn't a war game or anything like that. But the point being is, I went back to our tent and said, "Oh my gosh, like there's nobody upstream." vetting these or looking at these or taking them, you know, these are the smart guys from San Antonio that know this stuff better than we had. They took them verbatim. So it, as it turned out, I mean, we, we did a really, really good job. The, 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 that's or- gotta, that's gotta harden you. Right. Because now oh, yeah. you, you know, like you really have to double check your work because no one else is. I mean, we, we were <laughs> uh, 18 ish hours a day, every day forever. And, and part of it was it went so fast that we had, to, we had 12 hour shifts officially, but we really had, 
almost two or three hours on either end of the shift to hand off to the other people because stuff happens so quickly in wartime. And uh, these guys maybe this, this happened, these guys did this. And uh, so the net effect is uh, you sleep all the time. I'll show you these pictures of us in the mm -hmm. tent. Everybody, the joke was everybody in our tent was taking pictures of each other sleeping because we were sleeping or working, right. nothing in between. And, uh, but, but the serious part of this was it was a, you know, we did, we did well. Uh, it was intellectually a very interesting process. And I mean, uh, we did a lot of things like mapping to understand where the most, uh, optimum routes were for the, for us to go in to avoid radar detection mm -hmm. very broadly. I'll just say that broadly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of analysis, a lot of electronics. So we had this rich, interesting mix of engineers, electronic warfare officers and intelligence officers in this group. Uh, and it was, it was, like I said, it was very, very fulfilling. Now, one of the things we figured out halfway through, this is an actual war story. Um, we, there was a weapon system that they had an aircraft that they had that mimicked one of the aircraft that we used to have an F4, an old F4 wild weasel. Those were the ones that yeah, would shoot, shoot. Okay. Yeah. The weird, uh, kind of delta wings or whatever yeah and what, what what wild weasels did is they would shoot uh the uh, the uh radars of the surface air missiles so th these are the ones that would go in first mm -hmm. and do that and uh so that was kind of like and take fire sometimes too it was a tough mission right yeah. they're the first ones in and they would go in and wait for them to turn on and then go and go basically shoot them clear the airspace for the rest of the team to come in uh, the rest of the package, as they would say. And what happened is, is very interesting. We had this mix, again, of electronic warfare people, engineers, intel folks. What had happened is we realized, like, about a month or so into the war that the B-52s were flying in, and they were coming from off, off out of theater, Spain and, at the time, England. They would fly in, and they would come in. And these were all the old strategic air command, strategic bombers, had never really flown with the tactical air forces until 1991. It was a, a bit of a shotgun marriage. And so they're flying, and every night we got debriefs from them saying that we have these rear hemisphere intercepts. So these guys are coming in, like, at night, like, targeting us with their, their radars and then peeling out. We think that they're prepping for a shoot-down of a B-52, which would be a big coup, you know, for the Iraqi Air Force, because by then they were largely beaten down. And so this happened like two or three nights in a row. And we're talking to the B-52 crews over radios and talking to them in Spain and England. They're like, yeah, we, you know, we come back, we're spooked. We think this, these guys are basically stalking us, prepping for a, a shoot down. And one of the guys on our team said, you realize the radar par parameters of of that radar look very similar to this radar for the Iraqi Air Force, like almost exactly the same. And we started to do some mapping and figure it out. We did some, you know, and realized it wasn't, the Iraqis weren't flying at all at that point at night. We realized it was our guys. It was the F4Gs in the back of the package that were coming behind them mm. and essentially calibrating their radars on the B-52s <laughs> just to check and check in. <laughs> and what the B-52s were doing is they were shooting their their gun and the 50 cal gun in the back and the range is was really short, really small. So it was not even close to the F fours and the F four guys could see the tracers and we'd be like, ah, look at those guys. <laughs> they're, they're all wound up. <laughs> and this happened like three or four nights in a row. And it was our team that figured out, Hey, it's our guys. This is a fratricide thing. And it turned out to be a, a pretty cool thing, but it was like neat to be in the analysis part of that. It was a really interesting set under incredible conditions working hard you know we like i mentioned before we didn't shower we didn't we barely shaved for like 90 days mm -hmm. but that was an you know for the air forces and naval air forces and u.s air force there were a thousand aircraft aloft at night in january early january early february 1991 so it was a big big deal and the 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 origin story for me in security and i call it i don't call it cyber security i call it just call it security was Almost all of our systems out there broke. When I say all of them, at the time, DB, DB, DBase 3 and like whatever. We, yeah. we, we never lost situational awareness of where things were, but we had transitioned into a mode of clipboards, whiteboards, and, and also the two or three hour debriefs and handoffs and all that. So we never really lost 
awareness or we never had a mess up in that regard. But most of our stuff broke. We came back in 91, and you're old enough to remember this. It's like there was, that was the first time we had uh, been in a, a real kind of shooting war since Vietnam. We kind of exercised many of the Vietnam demons. And for 1991 to 92, I was on a, a bit of a road show to, to d- describe for a lot of people how we won the war. When in fact, we knew that we came real close to losing our electronically losing of situational awareness. So on top of that, myself and a handful of other uh, Air Force people went out to essentially fix or to create systems that, that built on what we learned out there. And how I got into security, cybersecurity, cyber, whatever you want to call it, was in many of these tr- trips and deployments, we didn't bring our sysadmin. And we had these big spark boxes because that was part of the thing with ginormous monitors, spark twos and spark fives with these ginormous monitors. Yeah, they weigh like a half a ton. They were, <laughs> but the the shock and awe, to use a, a future term of yeah. bringing these things, I mean, the, the, the Air Force pilots and navigators thought that we were just the yeah. smartest guys. In the, so we would go around, but like, and it was all Unix, all, you know, and sure enough, half the deployments, we didn't have a sysadmin. So we're just like, well, can you guys pick up Unix? So here we were, like a handful of Motley Band of Brothers, and that's how I learned Unix, circa 92, 93. And fast forward a couple of years later, the Air Force stood up its CERT, Computer Emerg- Emergency Response Team in San Antonio at the at that command down there. Mm-hmm. And they went around and almost like a Royal Navy press gang said, anybody have Unix experience? Like, it didn't care. They didn't care what career field you were in. They didn't care what your background was. Oh, you know, Unix, good enough. You know, like, come on down. So that's how I kind of got into it was like mid 90s Air Force CERT. Now, now just dangerous enough to know stuff Mm -hmm. and uh, learn by doing really. And so I credit all of it to the Air Force because I was a political science major. I mean, I didn't. Mm, Wow. I was an Intel guy. And like I the other thing about the Air Force is it's super technical. Like they have a very technical bias compared to the other services, I would argue. And so you're just kind of expected to know this stuff, even though you're an officer. It's like, okay, cool. So, you know. You remind me of a story I heard. It's kind of the other side of it. There, um, when when a bomb is going to be dropped, um, before it gets dropped, there's power going there. There might be websites running on a web server, sitting in someone's house somewhere or whatever. And so if you have enough internet telemetry of the target area and a bomb drops, you can tell whether it worked or not, whether that thing stayed online or not. And so there was a couple of companies out there that were kind of just deep probing around that environment, mm. around that time frame, And they're like, huh, this whole like section of the internet just went offline. Like that, that was a pretty large, you know, you know, detonation, not necessarily the, the explosion itself, but the, the net effect was large because it took out this big chunk of the, you know, some country or whatever. I, I would, uh, first of all, let me caveat what I told you is ancient history as it relates to the air force. And I mean, warfare in general and what's happening in Ukraine and Gaza is probably more to the moment, but no, I would say the approach and the uh, methodology and kind of the cross pollination between all of it was quite interesting. And, uh, you know, we effectively took a cold war military and pointed it at a third world country, Iraq. So it wasn't, it was never a fair fight. Uh, but it was interesting in that, you know, First of all, it wasn't a fait accompli that we were going to win. That was the other thing. We look back. Uh, I do remember all the scud alerts. I do remember mm-hmm. a point two or three weeks into it, we thought we're winning this thing. Now they're going to take the gloves off, and they're going to send whatever they can. You got a million men. Uh, I wasn't. I was <laughs> well, less was, worried about the million men. I was worried about the. That's what they were advertising. Yeah. Oh yeah. That too. Million, million man army, the second largest army on earth, or something. Oh yeah. Crazy. It was uh, no shortage of hyperbole there, right? right? right. Uh, but I mean, like at the moment, at the time, there was, you know, it was, it was very serious in retrospect. Um, but that was 1991. I mean, that's so long ago. I don't even, you know, like as to be. But the point being is, I think those analysis skills that we had out there we're so parallel to what uh, what I've come to find out to be in our career field. I mean, like the analysis part and the understanding, anomaly detection. Uh, what you know, like like I remember, you know, we're helping guys, you know, aviators, air crews do mission planning. We're always trying to find anomalies. Why does that 
why does that particular radar site look good, different? Or why, does, why are these guys doing something different? Uh, we didn't know in many instances, or we just to say, oh, maybe there's Russian you know, advisors at that site, which probably was the case, but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like there's like when you have this stuff happening, the amount of data that comes to you is just breathtaking, as you might imagine. And your ability to sort through the chaff, all of it, all the time, and keep your wits about you and say, okay, that's important, and this is why. That, I mean, that, that was, it was cool to learn that at that level, at that scale, at an early time. And I, I do think it really kind of informed me going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Nowadays, you can use something like uh, Bit Discovery or whatever, just no matter <laughs> what it is. And I'm serious. And you can draw circles around, you know, some blob of an entity or whatever and say, well, these things fall in this geographic region, IPGO. And you just draw a circle around that stuff and say, oh, this is all compromised now. We know it, it belongs in enemy, enemy territory. Um, so there's some pretty crazy internet telemetry shit that can well, be done I mean, with very simple techniques, actually. Mo mo most general, like, it begs the question, why would you go fly an aircraft around and do this when you can do certain things without doing that? Yeah, you and, don't have to. And I'll, I'll give you the greatest example. I mean, like, like the IDF or Israeli yeah. Air Force shutting down certain the entire integrated air defense in Syria more than once to do missions and then... Uh, I, I remember, I forget where I was at a conference sometime. This is in the 90s. I was still in the reserves. And I said, oh, this is what I do. I'm in the Air Force Information Warfare Center. And the, the two pilots were like, I just want to thank you for turning stuff off. That's all they said. And, and, and that's probably an exaggeration, but that's pretty cool. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like if you can turn off the entire air defense system, so the, the you know the good guys can get in and out, then you know you you save you save lives at least on our side. I mean the the parts that I do know that are fully unclassified but still amazing are you know it's basically these tomahawks or modified versions of tomahawks are flying in and they look like battalion. There's this massive yeah okay all right well. I do know that okay let me let me tell <laughs> okay, you that all right, story. All right, all right. I, I didn't we didn't okay that's a good story yeah okay so uh, I remember seeing a message pre Desert Storm that was asking. Anybody that had ground launch cruise missile background report to so-and-so, you know, like, and I remember seeing this message. It was an innocuous message, but like, are we thinking about nuking them? Like, what the, I mean, that was <laughs> kind of, some of us thought, but what they did, what we did, I didn't know about it at the time because I was in the North and I think this was very compartmentalized or very dark, uh, is they put what are called radar uh, reflectors on the tomahawks and they i think they adapted their speed or whatever and they made them look like the wild weasel f4gs mm -hmm. so the first wave that went over baghdad was actually these um these ground launch cruise missiles which by definition the from the um start two were supposed to be destroyed in arizona they took all of them flew them on a one-way mission but what it did was it like it's like kicking a fire ant pile. I mean, the whole Iraqi air defense system lit up, shot at them. The second wave were the F4Gs. Right. And that's, so that was, that's actually a true story. I knew about it. I didn't, I mean, we were so, we had our own little war up there in, in <laughs> Turkey in the north. Like some of the stuff we found out after the fact, uh, which is kind of interesting and other stuff we didn't know. But anyhow, that's, uh, uh, that, that is a true story and others know it better than I do, but that's a pretty cool example. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of that fusion of electronic warfare and kinetic warfare. That's, Oh yeah. And that's getting more and more and more interesting. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that interesting back in those days by comparison. And now it's just crazy. Like if you look at the F 35 or something where they have all this fusion sensor data and they can see in three dimensional space, like through their cockpit, through their goggles or whatever, like the amount of engineering that went into getting all of that sensor data in the first place, let alone making it visible and, you know, are useful in the cockpit is pretty insane. There's a whole world out there. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just there, leave it at that. And I, and I haven't been in that world for a long time, but I can only imagine. And it is kind of funny when I see a bunch of, you know, retired generals and ex intelligence community folks that will always say, Oh, you remember this? It's like this, but that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, so like without re revealing state secrets, I'm like, Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. But yeah. it has gotten more complex. And, um, you know, it, it just is, it's hard to keep up with. I do keep, because I'm in San Antonio, I am close to a lot of the people down there in that, the Air Force world, at least for the intelligence in cyber. I do kind of keep up with a lot of it, but it changes so much. I mean, 
Uh, I, I do think the Air Force went through a period where they went from electronic warfare. They thought that wasn't cool because it's now information warfare. Mm. And then it was command and control warfare. And they went through all these iterations. And um, I think what we're learning from Ukraine right now <clears throat> is that good old bread and butter electronic warfare is also important. Mm -hmm. You know, jamming and denying. I mean, specifically GPS signals, for right. example. Uh, again, I mentioned it, but I think that both specifically Ukraine and perhaps a lesser degree Gaza Israel right now are test beds for future, you know, nation state conflict yeah. more than anything else. I mean, China and Russia are definitely very closely monitoring what's going on in both. I mean, Russia's in the middle of it, obviously. And, oh, yeah. and but I'm sure they're very curious what the Israelis are doing because we sell them a lot of stuff and uh, they're, yeah. they're always kind of on the forefront of cybersecurity as well. I mean, uh, I think it's safe to say from a tactics standpoint, it's changing so quickly out there in those two places that part of the reason they're keeping track of it is that it's just evolving so rapidly, mm -hmm. the, the tactics and how they, how they uh, do things. And interesting aside, one of the things that happened after the Vietnam War <clears throat> was a realization that the POWs, the pilots that were shot down, should not die to hold on to state secrets that are so incredibly perishable, ephemeral, that um, that, that, that they should give as much as they can, with you know, try to withstand as much as they can, and then at, at some point it's okay to uh, trade what you know for your life, right? Why is that okay? Because the mission and the war changed within 72 hours. Their tactics just went upside down and changed again. Well, especially, especially because you know that that guy is gone and he has a bunch of secrets. So it's like, okay, we're gonna have to change a battle plan. Well, even that aside, yeah, I agree yeah. with that. But yeah, yeah. that aside, the pace, the dy dynamic change of tactics is so much that whatever that person knew on a Tuesday is different from the following Tuesday. So don't die for that. So I think that's part of it too, is it watching mm. how both sides are reacting. Uh, I saw the intel intelligence report from DOD that was that 87% of frontline troops, Russian troops, have, have been, you know, treated or wounded or, or KII. That's astonishing. Uh, but but I, I by do, conventional weapons too, which is, oh, it's it's an, well, it's I amazing. think well, I mean, for the record, they underestimated and so did we. I mean, I think our intelligence community said three days or yeah. what was the conventional wisdom? I don't think anybody. I mean, if you were the guy betting on two years in Vegas, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two years ago, you would have won the, the pot. I mean, <laughs> nobody thought. Uh, yeah. It's astonishing, you know, and that's the uh, thing about that warfare is like once you open up the Pandora's box. Okay, well, what do you think about drones um, and sort of the next generation getting pilots out of the battle space entirely? Like, yeah, I mean, that that is a uh, big cultural war within the Air Force. I can imagine. You know, uh, I, I think it's been several years since the Air Force graduated more pilots that went into, they don't say drones, they call them remotely piloted aircraft, RPAs. I see, I see. <clears throat> that might have changed too, but <laughs> like, 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 oh, we don't fly drones, we fly RPAs. Uh, I, I think the truth is, is the, the, the G forces and the, the, what aircraft can do, and the, or more importantly, what anti aircraft systems could do, will always outpace the human being. I mean, I, I've been, and I've flown. Uh, I just my my family and close friends know this. I was in pilot training for six months, didn't make it through, medically eliminated. Uh, I can say that I've experienced six, five to six G's. <laughs> I can't imagine north of that, you know. Uh, so, I mean, the truth is, is that I mean, the the, the weapon systems, the anti aircraft systems, can turn on a dime, and no pilot can, even with a G G suit or using G anti G maneuvers and all these different things. Um, I mean, you're still, you can't defeat that. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of reminded of kind of a thought experiment um, this is around autonomous cars, actually. And it's basically like, well, what can you do with an autonomous car if you didn't have to worry about safety? If you could get rid of the seatbelts, if you could get rid of the airbags, yeah. if you could get rid of the, you know, the, um, you know, the, uh, a, the A crash bars or whatever, you know, yeah. the bumpers and you start stripping out all this stuff like, what is this car capable of doing now? Hmm. What is it? What would it look like? And I think it's similar with drones. Like, well, if you don't have to worry about pilot safety at all, because there's no pilot there. No, it's, I mean, like, like it, you're making you the case for non-manned space missions. Yeah. You know, like, like this, this, the systems to support a human being are incredible. You know, uh, the oxygen, the, you know, in the case of fighter pilot, you know, the ejection seat and all, all that. And armor and everything else. Um, probably the bigger 
crisis, not crisis, that's a bit, the bigger dilemma is a better word that the Air Force has to go through is do you spend a hundred and whatever million on an, a single seat fighter or do you spend a hundred million on about, you know, a thousand drones? Mm -hmm. That's the quandary that they have. And I think, uh, I, I think it's safe to say, well, it's, it's, it's true. It's not safe to say it's true. It's safe to say and true that the people's liberation army have been looking at how we uh, our, our status of forces and how we go, uh, uh, you know, would go to war. Um, I mean, we have aircraft carriers. They don't, you know, we have certain capabilities. We have forward bases in the Pacific. Uh, they don't, uh, well, they have ones in the mainland China, but I mean, they have been looking at this for, studying it for, for two decades, for generations. And you'll be happy to hear though, the air force itself has a chain of very large bases in the Pacific in Japan, Okinawa, Guam, two, uh, two or three big ones in Korea. And they have fully recognized and have ad adapted and adjusted now to quickly uh, build and be able to populate a series of secondary and tertiary uh, airfields mm -hmm. because they just assume, you know, uh, Anderson Air Base in Guam, Kadena Air Base in uh, Okinawa, Yokota, all the uh, on mainland Japan, they are most certainly going to be an area of interest in any type of conflict. So why would you put all your eggs <clears throat> in those baskets? If you were a betting man, do you think uh, China is going to go try to take out Taiwan? <sighs> wow, you had to go right there. I'm just curious. Right? Okay. Uh, I will tell you what I... I have heard from other smarter people, uh, people that I, I don't view as neocons that are not girding their loins and are not, not hawkish, they're not hawkish, that there's an, an inevitability in what they talk and how they talk mm -hmm. that is most concerning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've heard very similar things. And these are people that I've known and known for a very long time uh, that I trust. And I go, Oh, okay. And, and, one of them uh, is a retired three star that I like very much. And I work with in San Antonio and I called him and I was like, Oh yeah, just catching up. And he's like, Oh, I'm in Hawaii. I'm like, cool. You're in Hawaii vacation. No, I'm at Indo mm -hmm. doing a, uh, a war game, tabletop exercise. I'm like, Oh no. Uh, so I, I think there's a bunch of forces on their side, uh, demographics, economics, all that. Uh, Xi Jinping is not getting younger, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so the conventional wisdom that I heard this year was 18 months. Well, that was six months ago, so I guess it's 12 months, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, we really don't know. I think making, if Ukraine does as well as it has done, that that makes them take pause, no no doubt. Now, what, what does that mean? Uh, you know, unconventional warfare and different means there's other ways aside from a frontal assault that they can make life difficult over there uh <clears throat> and i think that is that is what we're both most likely to see uh it has driven the japanese and, and koreans uh to cooperate more closely the vietnamese are our new best friends the filipinos uh, I yeah, went China to has a, not been making a lot of friends in the region. I went to, I have to find this on LinkedIn or Facebook or where the heck I put it, but I flew, I was at black hat or FSI SAC, uh, FSI SAC Asia <laughs> six years ago. Like, and I flew over the Spratleys between, uh, Vietnam and Philippines. I took a picture. I could look right down and said, here's the Spratleys. You don't know what they are now, but you will in the next decade. And that was kind of ominous, <clears throat> to which most of my friends said, I, we still don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> but but um, I think it's safe to say geopolitically um, that, that that is an area of deep concern. And I would point out between two different presidential administrations that almost agree on nothing at all, uh, between Trump and Biden, they were pretty consistent on that policy towards that country. And it's it's the one thing in Capitol Hill that, you know, the, 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 the deeply divided parties seem to agree on. So I don't know. And I don't think, uh, we are by any means prepared, uh, and mentally or otherwise, I think this, so I hope it doesn't happen. It, I, you know, to some degree be suicidal because we're their biggest market. Like, yeah. Like why would they do that? So I, I, I think it is the, would be the dumbest thing, uh, that anyone could do, but I thought invading Ukraine was pretty dumb too. So they did it mm -hmm. or he did it. I should say he did it. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's table that for now. Uh, super interesting topic. I'd love to continue sometime. Um, but uh, maybe next year when it next will year. have happened or not happened. <laughs> yeah, we have an emergency <laughs> arsenic show when it happens. Like, what's your hot take? Yeah, bad. Exactly, it's bad. Uh, okay, so you, from the Air Force, you thought computers are interesting. You learned Unix mm-hmm. um, somewhere along the way. So how, what was the sort of the next step in your evolution? It, not straightforward. Uh, I, I, I got out and I started a dial-up ISP which was like the most fun. I couldn't miss the internet. Uh, this is like 95 ish. Okay. And it was a company called on ramp access, which was essentially the franchise of I an used to o- use on ramp. Yeah. ONR.com, uh, Chad Kissinger, CEO founder. He and I were partners. I, I basically did the San Antonio franchise. Uh, it was pretty cool. Cause I mean, we were running and gunning. We had a bunch of interns about two or three of them are CISOs now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the funny stories are, you know, uh, <clears throat> it was all, we had to send packages out, little diskettes. And I remember one time uh, we had a Saturday call. I was in working Saturday and a Mac user needed a, a, a package, an install package. You're like, oh, great, a Mac user. This is back when Macs were like, <laughs> oh, great. We had like one Mac in the office to puke out these little 35 diskettes uh-huh. we're like oh great okay anybody anybody remember how to do this and and we did it was this guy comes and knocks on the door it's david robinson the san antonio spurs legend seven foot whatever one and he came by to get a, a and we he sat down there for like two hours and talked to us about the internet and fun mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. that was a fun memorable story uh the other funny story was looking at uh the traffic i'm like i'm i was you know fairly technical but not as technical as the people that work for me which is a constant theme uh <laughs> i'm okay with that uh but i noticed like what is all this port was it one one nineteen of this nntp i think it was it's like what's all this time, NNTP? time protocol <laughs> now what is i think what i forget what network news uh, time, oh, uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah you're right was you're right, it 119 right. uh, uh, cra- no, yeah yeah nntp i see nntp yeah, yeah. nntp yes all dot binaries dot sex yeah. dot erotica well or it was i would say like 80 <laughs> percent of the traffic was i was like no john they came to me like john this is what it is like oh are you serious that's so sad like like 80 percent of the traffic and we didn't really do logging very well so that's why they signed up for us they, they didn't uh-huh. we didn't yeah. log anything yeah. uh we also figured out during the day i think that, that might be why we used you as well by the way they, <laughs> a, yeah. no longer uh no no, but no. those are the good old days before stuff. But it was fun. And then I kept in the Air Force doing that reservist stuff with the AFSERT. And I got recruited by a guy. This is like 97-ish. I sold the company on ramp or sold it my part of it. I, it was, I was working 80 hours a week to make payroll. And I, I was uniquely unqualified to do it. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean that. I, it's a true story. I sold my car for cash. I drove my parents' Oldsmobile. Mm-hmm. True story for a long time. That was very humbling. I was like, okay, this is an entrepreneur's deal. I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat ramen. I did all of it. Mm-hmm. And there's a point where I was like, okay, this is – So one of my friends said, what point do you think pushing the rock up the hill you're going to get to the top of the hill? And I was like, I have no idea. He's like, then you need to sell your business or get out of it. So I got out of it in it's like 98, 97 and worked for a company. Got a car? <laughs> uh, not for a while. I bought a used. Yeah. It's a it's a funny story. Uh, but yes, I did eventually get a car and gave. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I learned the hard way, and I learned that like jumping into something without business wise without knowing anything is not a. I mean, you you, you can't brute force your way to success. I'm right? not so sure about that, John. I well, really am not. Well, I okay. I certainly that's not the conventional wisdom. You should know what your the industry you're going in, but. I think there is something to be said about people who, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, I hope you take it how it's meant, who are too dumb to know that they shouldn't be doing the thing that they're doing. And they just, they're so enthusiastic. They're like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And they just kind of like break everything and it ends up working and they end up doing very well, but Mm. not, not because they were prepared, but more because they had no idea how many roadblocks were going to get in their way. And by that point, they're already so committed. They just kind of just barrel through the roadblocks i've seen it both ways i i i do think certain things like work ethic and uh, i also read i'm not a uh some people will laugh when they hear this i'm not a sales guy by background and i um i read every sales book i possibly could because it was coming from the air force background uh very difficult 
So, you know, selling things and getting people to trade money for service and all that, I, yeah. it didn't come entirely natural. So I did learn a lot uh, at that time. And it was also very technical, running an ISP. And uh, I do remember a very low moment, uh, my sister's wedding and rehearsal dinner in Houston on a Friday afternoon, we had a cable cut to our local loop. And the whole ISP was down. I remember Gosh. that. And I, we, we got restored service. So, so there was the wild, wild west days of doing that. I then went from that to a company called Trident Data Systems. Um, we had a bunch of talented security folks there. It was an ex-government contractor that had spun out a commercial group. Uh, we had what was the uh, the 303 crew guys there. Tri Trident as in Navy SEAL? No, it? Trident Data Systems, not related at all. They all came from the space world, mm -hmm. space launch, which is hyper secure, as you can imagine. Uh, they were well, based in, well, mostly. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, at the time. Uh, but they were based in L.A., <laughs> I remember, I remember a buddy of mine had broken into a satellite system, um, spacing out his name at the top of my mind. But uh, th there was there was exploits in the satellite systems way back in the day, and I think he ended up going to jail temporarily. And then the judge like, "You got to get out, of, get this kid out of jail, and go have him work in the DD." Yeah. And so there were a bunch of folks that worked for us that had retired at eighteen. If you get my drift, mm -hmm. that I could tell really knew a lot we had a guy that was like 19 that knew everything about certain protocols like how did you learn all this and his response was uh i was walking down a road and an apple hit my head and i learned everything <laughs> it was da dave cowan big dave out of the valley and uh between dave and the the guys from uh the 303 crew we i mean they just like they were our pen test team and they always got in and we didn't know how well, it was probably zero days at the time. Yeah, they uh, wrote them. And they wrote them. Or and, traded, and, or traded. And my other funny story is, uh, and I won't reveal who this was, but I we were at a telco one time, and this is like 97, 98, and one of the guys we were meeting with, we're, this is like a sales meeting, right? And we're talking about our capabilities. And uh, <laughs> the guy that was our the client or prospect was talking about, Oh, I earned my spurs back a few years ago, early nineties by catching these teenage hackers and da, 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 go to the war store. It's like, okay, interesting. I was in the app cert, So I talked to, I did the app cert, the defense side. So I'm pretty, at the end of the meeting, I walk out and the guy that's with me didn't say a word. I'm like, Hey, Hey, captain silent. Um, great, great value add in this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, well, I was just so frightened because I think that was me that he was talking about back in the <laughs> early nineties. I was like, Oh no. Uh, -huh. uh, so we had a very legitimate crew there who, um, uh, Jericho from dimensional, uh, oh, yeah. Brian Martin, yeah, I know him well. uh, you know, uh, Brian Keenan, Chris Ramsey, all these guys that were just lethal. But the funny thing is they didn't like writing reports. They would do all the hard part. Oh yeah. And like, that's the, sh get, that's the crappy part. And then get, Hey, and they get, here you go. Here's our tar Explain file. Explain this a, thing you did. Like, and, oh, and you like looking, it's it, horrible. Like it's a, the second project was a forensics deal where it's like, go through, Oh, there's a pound at the end. Oh, okay. I guess they got rude at this point. And then you had to do a forensics job to figure out how the path. See, this is why LLMs, they're, they're like 30 years too late. That would have been oh, yeah. so helpful back good. then. Like, <laughs> just take the tar file. And, uh, <laughs> but I remember there's a guy named Gene Scriven that's a CEO, a C, excuse me, CISO of ACI, I think, in Florida or somewhere. Gene Scriven was the manager of the pen test team at the time. And all these Motley Crew of guys, uh, and they're fantastic, but... I remember they had to finish a report and he would not let them leave until they finished a the report. Like in the office, like you cannot leave until like barring the door. So there's like crazy <laughs> stories. Uh, Back then that was a thing. Like, yeah. You this could, is you like 90, treat, you 97. Can, you could treat your employees that way. <laughs> 97 time frame, long, long, long ago history. Uh, but it was a good group. And I, I think the thing that's where we might've crossed paths the first time. I have no idea, Maybe. but that's when I went to DEF CON, Black Hat, RSA, those, those conferences, which were, immensely much cooler yeah, back what, then. Yeah, what, uh, I totally agree. Actually, I'd be curious why, why you say that. Um, I, there was... I mean, I got my theories. I think they were more like a reunion at that time. Uh, and you saw mm -hmm. people and it was... There was a level of auth authenticity that just was assumed. And it was like half the people that came from the attack side... And half the people that came from dot, dot mill or whatever, but, but, but there was like a 
extreme bias for a technical or an appreciation of technical things, I guess. And, and uh, offensive in particular. Offensive in particular. Yeah. Um, now that still exists, uh, you know, but, 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 but I mean, there's just so many people now that, you know, uh, it, it, it's almost in pockets. You get it during certain tracks here or there. Um, but. See, I don't, I don't really see it at all anymore. I mean, <clears throat> as you said, it might be in pockets, but that was the difference is you didn't have to go anywhere to be in it. It was just everywhere. Yeah. Like the whole thing was the pocket, you know, it wasn't like I had to find some special group who was doing a special thing. And I remember having weird conversations at DEF CON, maybe it's about maybe 10 years ago or something. And I go in these meetings and I'm like, Oh, somebody from Spotify was there or something back when Spotify was just starting yeah. kind of thing. And, you know, oh, it's so great. You know, it's great to um, use your product. I think it's interesting, blah, blah, blah. And I talked to these guys and they're like, <clears throat> anyway, we're going to go have some beers. They're like uninterested in talking about security. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, mm. what do you, wh like, what are you here for? Like, oh, you know, just basically here to drink. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, uh, but, I mean, but that, but that was happening all over the conference. Like I wasn't getting, yeah. I, I think, I can't remember who I was telling this story to somebody. This was back when I was super like, you know, knee deep in everything. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I went to uh DEF CON and I posted something like, like, uh, Hey, I'm, I have this new theory I'm working on. Um, if anyone wants to talk web app sec, meet me at this bar at this time. Click, click jacking me per, um, per chance. It, was. Uh, <laughs> no, but it, back in the day. Uh, no, I think it was my anti-censorship research. I was able to mm. take down most of China. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> using the censorship system against itself. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was that exploit. Um, and uh, so I posted it and DEF CON even retweeted it to everybody, right? Mm. So the so this isn't like people are going to miss it, right? You know, mm. like anyone who's looking at Twitter at all. And a lot of, a lot of people are doing that kind of one. They're just kind of bored. Yeah. No one showed up. Oh, interesting. No one showed up. Um, most recently, I think the biggest kind of aha moment to me was um, if you go in the Discord channel for, for DEF CON, there isn't a hacking channel. Mm-hmm. Or, or security or whatever. There's not like, like there used to be like, you know, there we used to be like places you go and you're like, Oh, th th we're talking about hacking here. We're talking about breaking into things. We're talking about this. It's just, it's kind of missing now. Um, I'm sure it still happens. It just doesn't happen there. It doesn't happen in, in the broad daylight that it used to happen. <sighs> I'm trying to think. Um, I agree. And, and I miss it. I miss, the, I, I miss being able to walk around and you just kind of look over. You're like, man, that guy's doing something amazing on his computer right now. And you talk to this person over here and they've got some crazy research and they really want to talk to somebody about it. You know, like I, I got to get it out of my head, you know? And there was, um, it's so big now that like even finding those pockets is tough. I mean, one yeah. thing I like to do is monitor how much I walk when I'm there. Like I'm old enough for like, how many steps did I have? You know, like, mm -hmm. like it's like eight or 10 miles. Yeah. A day, yeah. You know, it's like you. I walked forty miles this week. But Back then, from, I was too drunk to walk that far. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I just think that um, it's hard to find those places, and there's just like a lot of stuff. Um, uh, I think that RSA has become like just such a ginormous conference that it's it's like the big sales force or the big you know the big ones, and then right. essentially Black Hat has become you know, what RSA was a few years and then, yeah, but okay. So in, in all of their defense, right? Like yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to steal man what's going on there. So I can't, I can't talk so much about DEF CON, but definitely black hat and RSA. I feel like when I was, when I was a young pup coming up through DEF CON, mm -hmm. I would look at the people with black hat badges and I'm, and I would tell my friends, whoever I was there with like James or somebody else. And I'm like, those guys are the real experts. Mm, you know, yeah. they, they aren't, <clears throat> they aren't like hacking exactly. They're the ones who actually have to secure the things that we're talking about. They're the ones who actually yeah. have the job. Authenticity. They're, they're, they're the legit. real actual people doing this work and they are here as well, which means that they're also technical. You know what I mean? This, you yeah. know, when we're at, when we're at DEF CON or Black Hat or sorry, DEF CON. Yes. So when I finally got to uh Black Hat on my own merits, cause I was speaking there, you know, mm -hmm. so I was, I was, that's the only reason I could ever afford to go back then. Right. So I would, I'd get paid to go and I would be looking around and I'd be like, yes, this is where I belong. I belong with the people who are professional hackers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they do this, 
you know, they don't look like the other group of people, you know, they don't have like the pink hair and the, you know, tattoos yeah. and shit, but they, or maybe they do, but they're, it's all hidden behind a suit because they have to have a corporate job. And so they have the, re- and so I always looked up to that. I'm like, ah, okay, because that's really, we need to get out of it all just being a bunch of, you know, punks and kids and yeah. stuff. And which I was too as well, but we need to move into this much more professional version of us if we're ever going to be taken seriously by the board. Because I was thinking like big picture, like how do we actually oh, yeah. move the needle, right? Because ultimately we have to protect our <clears throat> our parents, our grandparents, the people who don't know anything about security, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I actually look at RSA and Black Hat with a certain affinity for finally kind of professionalizing our industry. However, <clears throat> DEF CON was never supposed to be that. Oh, DEF CON. Yeah, there's a... It was never supposed not. to be that. It was supposed to be the place where hackers go to hack, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it became much more of a cultural thing than it w- was a technical thing. And I, I missed that. I wish it had stayed... <clears throat> primarily technical with a little bit of culture, if that makes yeah. sense. I was going to tell you, one thing that I have done that has brought me back into the community that I like a lot, it was Trey Ford's idea, by the way. Mm-hmm. Give him credit. I'll, I'll get him on the uh, podcast one of these days. Tr- you hear that, uh, Trey? You're on the podcast. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I left, I, I, well, after the Denim Group acquisition, I was at Coal Fire, and I was kind of like, look, I want to give back. I want to, you know, kind of, what do I do next? And Trey said, why don't you be a speaker coach at Black Hat? And I was like, Oh, that would be cool. Hmm. So I've done that two years in a row. That is neat because that's great. Uh, it's typically people that uh, have English as a second language, and the the whole thought was these guys have great ideas, great exploits, great oh, stories, man. and they but because of language challenges, 100%. and so it 100%. was it was cool because like I'll tell you, there's one or two that I've had where they started off with like 90 slides, and their first version they got through like four. I was like, well, okay. And, and, uh, or they learned, um, one of my recent ones who I liked a lot from, uh, from Shanghai, he, uh, had learned a lot of English from Google translate. And so the words come out different or the pronunciation. So that was very helpful, but it was super rewarding. And I enjoyed uh, working with those guys a lot and mm-hmm. getting, I felt like, like a proud <clears throat> dad when they're out there yeah, and they nailed sure. it, you know? So, so that's contributed and that's been one that has been, um, a neat, process and again part of and these are real researchers right this real researchers okay, and right. i so i'm not you know questioning their their research i would just say this every single time i was like get somebody that knows your space and have them look at it too because <laughs> mm-hmm. i don't i mean we're talking ios exploits android exploits well, that's what the review <clears throat> is for yeah that's what they're for yeah. but but for mine is more delivery and kind of mm-hmm. hey i'm i i probably look more like the generic uh attendee and if i don't get what you just said or if you didn't tell a story, a lot of times they don't tell stories or they get up and it's just like whammo right to like an extern window. And you're like, whoa, yeah, hey. Yeah. You know, like, like, uh, <laughs> so it's like work your way through it. How is this important? Why? Tell right. a story, get up there. But it's been neat. I mean, like uh, one of my guys, the guy from Shanghai, when uh, I, he brought, uh, I, I bought him a cowboy hat to take back and he uh, got me a Shanghai Starbucks mug, which is kind of funny. Uh, but so it's that's a cool thing to do within the community that I, sure. I I enjoy and meeting new people that you wouldn't necessarily yeah, guys that I wouldn't uh, yeah. I would never interact with, and it's just kind of a cool. That's that's I'm I'm happy I'm and, doing and, that and worldly too because these are all people. By the way, I'm not fully giving myself credit for this idea, but I definitely did give them this feedback that one of the major problems was this exact issue. It's like well, you have these amazing researchers probably uh, probably yeah. right but they sh- they sh- stand up there and they they don't know the language they aren't great presenters they might be a little autistic or All something um <clears throat> they I, haven't proofed their slides they haven't finished their slides <clears throat> i usually start off by saying let me let me just say this my mandarin is terrible it's not <laughs> or my polish or czech whatever yeah but 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 that you're not trying to speak in their country in their yeah. language and and if uh, you were i would say hey you got to get on your game and you got to practice way more because a lot of people think like i'll finish it the night before they're like they're down to the wire and i'm like for a black hat you should probably in rsa should probably spend two to six months in your research and probably a month or two putting the deck together to make sure it all flows. Yeah. And then probably another month making absolutely sure you got all your ducks in a row before you actually get on stage. Now, and, and the other That's role, almost a full year of doing that. The other role is to be a speaker coach and to make people present. To you. <laughs> uh, so one of, I'll just tell a story. One of our 
former clients, uh, Jeremy Long, who's now at ServiceNow. He's a big OWASP guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a great, I mean, he has a pretty interesting presentation about so, some supply chain uh, challenges, you know, uh, and exploits in build tools. I mean, uh, but his idea was fantastic. I knew he was going to do well. For me, with him, it was like, no, get back and do your presentation. He like, mm -hmm. like. Uh, there is, I think, for the U.S. speakers, sometimes a little bit of an overconfidence. Oh, I'll do this. I do speak all the time. Okay, yeah. cool. Show me. You know, I'm, I'm from Missouri. Yeah. Show me. You know. Yeah. And so this other part of the speaker role is to, you know, be a a meeting on the on the calendar of the speaker that they can't avoid. You know. Mm -hmm. So like, anyhow, it it worked out really well. One of the sad things though at Black at Black Hat this year is I think three of my speakers, we had a speaker collision. They were all scheduled at the same time. Ouch. So I only got to see one of them. And, 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 uh, well, you can buy the DVDs if you really, yeah, if you really that, want to. Not, not that badly, no. Yeah. Uh, they but, should supply it to you. They should give it to you for free. I, I will let them know that. I you I should let them idea. know that, and I will uh, I will do the same. It's a cool program. Me. Well well done. Yeah. Um, and I'm, like I said, happy to have a very, very small role in it. it you know, the, again, I'm not going to claim full responsibility for all of this, but uh, another one that I brought to Black Hat is you don't have a defense track. Mm, yeah, that's another one. Yeah, like, no, it's attack, attack, attack. It's attack, all attack. attack but, yeah. but, you know, for me yeah. as a offensive researcher, I generally prefer those. And also I think it puts more asses in seats. So from it a, totally does for 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 just getting people into the room, hundred percent. I did a presentation on that topic. I called it breach fixation. Like you want to get everybody's attention, talk about the Chinese, Russians breaches, you know, this exploit, this. Mm -hmm. But that's, but that's great. But what about like patching velocity right. or access control? This, I mean, like you know, this. Where do most organizations fall down? It's the basics, yeah. you know, well, so, and, and they don't do it at all. Oh, they don't do it at all. And, and, and like, so talking about, you know, going to a conference where you have all the whiz bang and you have this and that and the latest exploit and so and so cool, but how is your patching, you know, or how, and what patching, yeah, you know, what patching, what or, logging, you know, what, what logging, backups? <laughs> meaningful log reduction, <laughs> what interpret? I mean, like this is stuff from 1992, yeah. 94, 96. Well, the, this is a common thing that Jeremiah says. He's like, are you ever surprised when a new exploit comes out? Like it was, is it really a surprise? And could we not have had what, whatever existing defenses we've already had? Could we not have applied that to this and stopped it? And the vast majority of exploits that are out there that are new, it's like, yeah, we already knew about that. We already knew, and we didn't know about that particular exploit, but we already but. knew, we knew how to stop it. We knew how to mitigate it. We knew how to, you know, to reduce the damage potential by, you know, compartmentalizing or, I mean, there's always mitigations and we always know what they are. It's not new science. This isn't, we're not coming up with new security very frequently. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would argue that about the time we have certain things down, now there's another platform, you know, like, like, yeah, like, uh, true. You know, throw, throw that in there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, um, that is true. Although that is even getting a little bit better because of better frameworks. I would agree with that. I mean, like, like, uh, let me see if I can put it this way. There are good days and bad days. <laughs> there are days when I'm like, thank God we're doing this and we had an impact. And, uh, I mean, there's definitely, I can draw a line between things that we did, particularly dinner group and, and products in the marketplace that, yeah, we looked at that and we found this and we found that, or, uh, you know, just, just a direct impact, uh, for on some retail clients and some banking clients. And then there's other days where you're like, Oh, you didn't do logging well and you had ransomware, you know, so, so you got dinged on like a open vuln that people have known about. So my going in view, and this is, I don't know if this makes people mad, but I, I generally view that if you get dinged by malware, excuse me, ransomware, ransomware, that you're just the slowest in the herd. Like that was, you don't hear the biggest and sophisticated guys going down all the time. Yeah, and, and and you ransomware. don't have and you have backups. Why don't you? And have and, and like you so so that's on you. But we see it all the time with these companies where it's like they yeah, which know. you should have anyway. I mean, first for normal just business continuity, just like someone spilled a cup of coffee in your computer. What are you gonna do? You don't have backups. <laughs> what was you just? What said, was your big plan? You just said the most <laughs> unsexy thing in our career field, which is. <laughs> Business continuity, data recovery, <laughs> but it's the most important. That's my point is right. like, like do all that first. And I, I tell people, my philosophy is like, like analyze one log first and then two and three, like do like, this is an AppSec story, but I did a thing at OWASP, gosh, in Austin, ironically, nearly a decade ago about, Hey, you should get your custom apps to like 
publish all these custom like logs that are specific to security events that are different from the events that typically come out from any application, which are more for uptime and how they crash and all this stuff like that. Most of the security people don't care about it. What you care about is where did it come from? What was its attack path? What did it do? How long was it in? I mean, like if, if you're building custom apps and you don't ask the developers to build that capability, you just, you just don't log it and it never gets presented. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, I, my argument has, has always been, you have a home field advantage. It's your apps. Like if you're a security team, you have to articulate positively what your, you know, what your rules, what, you know, what do you need out of that to interpret security events? Yeah. I used to log the entire HTTP request, all of it. And you'd be surprised the amazing stuff you'd find in there. Like you just don't even know that it's there until you log it. And most logs do not contain that. So most of the time you're never going to have any idea. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. Oh but, yeah. But we should, we should talk about denim groups since you brought oh, yeah? it up. Yeah. Uh, so how did that kind of come to be? Uh, okay. So the ISP that I ran, I put little air quotes in there uh, that ran me or whatever. One of the interns was a guy named Tyson Weiss who ended up starting a fantastic aviation company and sold it. His two partners in another company before that were Dan Cornell and Sheridan Chambers. Mm -hmm. And so I knew of them and they knew of me. And believe it or not, we bumped into each other at a happy hour and I kind of knew each other. And um, we basically did this crazy discussion where I was like, you know, you guys are developers. They're both big Java, custom Java guys. They came from that whole world and had sold a company uh, right before that and had a successful exit, I think, at 23. It's just wow. like crazy. Um, but I was a security person. And this is on the heels of At Stake and Foundstone. I was like, hey, let's do the like chocolate bar and peanut butter and security and applications and build AppSec and be essentially copy those guys a little bit and be the Texas version, you know, uh, best little AppSec uh, firm in Texas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was our original approach uh, in 2004, 2005. And we just started being ubiquitous and going to these places and learned and uh, got well, to a point. One, one thing that was different about you guys uh most people were pen testers. Most mm. people were not fixing anything. They were not actually getting in there and, and coding and because that's the unsexy, boring, but very oh, yeah. profitable. Mm. There's a lot of money to be made there, but it's hard slog. And most security people do not want to do that work. <laughs> I, uh, they don't want to do it at all. Yeah. I mean, like most developers don't want to do it. Yeah. Nobody wants to do it. I mean, and that's a really big societal problem. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, societally, you know, we find more vulnerabilities than we fix all the time. We're better at finding them than fixing them. So one of the things we did going in, and this is really a reflection of Dan and Sheridan, was, you know, we hired everybody that were developers. We had developers. We did do a lot of app dev, too, initially, where we'd say, oh, it's app dev, but secure app dev and remediation. When it was really custom Java, and we'd sprinkle some abuse cases and stuff like that. But what we had a big stable of developers, and so the remediation was obvious, but but more and more and more we did AppSec. We also, uh, when I say we as really Dan, thought of this idea to how to fix things automatically via a program called ThreadFix, application called ThreadFix. So yeah, can, we went from yeah, like... Talk, talk about that for a second. What, so, what was that? So what ThreadFix did is it, oh wait, again, the observation is it became easier for people to find vulnerabilities well, the other thing was, you know this, we won't go into it. You can go to Kyle's, uh, Kyle Hankins session, mm -hmm. uh, DAS, SAS, I asked, uh, all the different flavors. Mm -hmm. And what we realized is that he, all these- He used to work with you. Yes, he's a dinner group alumni, proud uh -huh. alumni. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> and he um, and I and others would realize, like, you have this smorgasbord of tools. None of them talk to each other. Not only are they don't talk to each other, dissimilar testing approaches. One's source code related, one's runtime environment, one's, you know, like they're all different. And um, so basically what this did was it took all the dissimilar feeds and normalized them. It deduped them and it also said, like, hey, here's the one that's really the most critical and it said, did some prioritization. Uh, we ended up building that. We were did the improbable. We took a consulting company and built a commercially viable product 
Uh, that's not typical. No, not at all. In fact, it's not even recommended usually because I would not recommend it. Yeah, uh, because you end up kind of stealing from your own stable of people and just well, becomes competitive internally. And but we did it. I, I mean, know. like, yeah, no, I'm not, it was, I'm not uh, saying you you didn't do it. I'm just saying, boy, I wouldn't recommend it normally. No, I wouldn't. And that's why most companies don't do that. But like, we looked up. Dan had a great idea. We had a great team. We also were starting to lose some of the app dev work because of competitive forces, rate, rate pressures and stuff like that. So it just made a logical thing. The other thing is a lot of people don't realize this, but we had a uh, e-learning platform, a CBT platform called, uh, it was, uh, it was a program that really just taught people how to do secure code. Uh, <laughs> it was called thread strong and it was like CBT, but like really glorified PowerPoint and some stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. But we sold a lot of it because people, you know, needed it. And we sold that to Veracode, gosh, maybe seven or eight years ago for cash. And we plowed all that money into ThreadFix. So selling, you know, ThreadStrong allowed ThreadFix to, to we financed a lot of that. And then we got, that. That's interesting. Um, we got a, a investment round after that from Wipro and, and we put a lot of that into that too. So, so it worked out, but it is not a clear path. And also we were in the business for a long time. So it's not your, we weren't a gazelle, but we were the, you know, the owners. This is what we knew this is what we're doing. I do think we pivoted really, really well. Uh, and you know, the thing that I'm proudest of is like the group of people that we had work with us that have gone on to do bigger and better things. I mean, Kyle Hankins is one of those examples. I mean, there's a ton of them that are out there. I actually looked at, um, before coming here, looked at my LinkedIn profile of everybody from White Hat that I know. Mm -hmm. And there's the same thing with White Hat. I mean, there's a ton of companies like that. All the diaspora that have gone out and done well. Absolutely. You and Jeremiah have done pretty well, too. <laughs> you know, like, 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 but that's probably what I'm most proud of is, is, is being in that technical environment, solving problems, helping these people, you know, and teaching them a some of the business stuff and some of the, the, the things that are don't come natural to most technologists mm -hmm. and saying, it's okay, you know, to, to, to do this stuff. It's okay to, to go on a sales visit, you know, like, like absent of sales, we, it's a very lonely company, you know, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. uh and I think if anything, in the last two years post acquisition. Um, yeah. Talk about that. So, so how, how'd that go? Uh, down? We, we got, uh, we were bought by coal fire in June of 2021 uh, a combination of the services and the product. Uh, and, you know, that was, we, you know, we had built it to a certain level. We were in the market for some time. And one of the interesting things is we, uh, I think we, I can say this safely. We were viewed as kind of good guys in the market. If you I know what I'm saying. Okay. So, I mean, so except I, for you. Yeah. Well, mostly, <laughs> mostly Dan. Mostly Dan. <laughs> no, I mean, like, like the reason I say that is the way we, met our investment bankers was a competitor who had been acquired and they asked, who else do you like? Who else is good out there? Oh yeah. The denim group guys. And so that actually helped. And, and I think part of that was uh, we were very, very serious at what we did, but we didn't take ourselves too seriously. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. particularly Dan and I, I yeah. mean like uh, deadpan humor, whatever you want to call it. I mean like, um, and, and funny t-shirts and all that good yeah, stuff. Yeah, Guerrilla marketing. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, all, do it. let's talk it. about that. Uh, oh, the t-shirt. Yeah, right let, yeah, let's okay. do the t-shirt. Because I think there's a timeline. It's 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 when okay. you're still there, right? It was uh, 2016, somewhere in there, 2017, maybe later. Um, RSA, and I had been to RSA for 20 years plus, And I just noticed the pitches were getting more and more over the top and more. And I was a, I am a vendor. I was a vendor. And so my original idea was I don't want people to waste their very well thought out sales pitch on me. So I should have had a t-shirt that said, I'm a vendor. Don't, you know, don't, don't call me or whatever. Or don't, but instead I went with this thing and said, don't have purchase authority. And what had happened <laughs> is I wore it. And, and again, this is what you can do when you own your company right. versus being an employee. I was like, yeah. ah, okay. Uh, I was at the W bar and I forget who it was, a, a Twitter person with a million and one followers took a picture and said, here's this lonely person with this T-shirt that captures the moment. And I wore it. I didn't know who it was. She didn't know my handle. So I just see people the next day. They're like, oh, my God, you're all over. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and what it did is it captured the moment. And I think that moment was one of like crazy over the top 
kind of commercialization, particularly as it relates to the uh, yeah. We we definitely took floor. it pretty far. Yeah, and the industry just went. Yeah. Now, now they go into your uh, hotel room and put things in physically in your hotel room. When oh, you name there. it. Like, I mean, like, uh, so so the funny thing is I have pictures with all these salespeople that thought it was the funniest thing ever. Nobody was ever really offended. The Sizzos loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's that commercial over-the-top thing. It kind of was in the moment. I did one right after that. So I've done these T-shirts that are kind of tongue-in-cheek. I did one at Black Hat right after that in 2017, there was a Russia T-shirt with a big flag, and it said 2016 election, U.S. election monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that got a lot of uh, heads turned. I've done uh, a few. I did one that was after that uh, Huawei U.S. network management team. Uh, <laughs> that was a good one. And then I had to like skirt around the Huawei booth and all that. Uh, but I think that's Better always show been, up as their boss, you know. Uh, either one. <laughs> but but I. I I, after the acquisition by Coal Fire, I really didn't want to do that anymore because it was a little yeah. too tongue in cheek or yeah. too cheeky. But I, I mean, it, it was, um, I would say that. Bring Paul, it back? You're going to. Maybe. I mean, we have, I guess, RSA is coming up. Sure. sure is. I, I don't like have it. an idea yet. Yeah. Uh, but one thing that I would tell you, I just had this experience. I, wanted to, I don't know if I told you the story, but I have experienced the onslaught of sales calls, ironically. Again, uh, for those that don't know, there's a John Dixon who is the CISO of Colonial Pipeline, mm. spelled exactly the same way, J-O-H-N-D-I-C-K-S-O-N. I've never met him. I've talked to him. He and I communicate. But some <laughs> some knucklehead <laughs> sales guy in the universe attributed my cell phone to his Zoom info record, uh-huh. which is the universal sales guy database right. that all the sales development reps, SDRs use. So I started getting calls this summer and I get them all the time, all the time. I had to go about two months ago and do that little switch in iPhone where if you don't have my contacts, I don't, doesn't even get to me before, because I was running a company and I have kids. I don't want my school kid nurse office to call and it goes to voicemail. So I had it open, the aperture open, but I was getting six or seven or eight calls a day. And my common feedback was number one, I don't yell at them or don't, I'm not evil to them or mad or whatever. But I'm like, look, you really got to work on your sales pitch. Like, you're calling me in the middle of the day. If it was a real John Dixon, he's probably got meetings. I'm just saying it's not well received by me. He's probably not going to work. And by the way, here's a good book by Jill Conrath on how to do sales stuff. Go read that. Make your art better. The SDRs used to work for me at my company. But, like, I was just really astonished at how, I mean, you call me in the middle of the day, expect me, oh, yeah, cool, I need an EDR solution or I need a SEM solution. I need, I mean, like it's it's just I don't know how that model still works. And here's the other thing I learned that was totally horse hockey. Um, they were calling me on a two one zero phone number, which is San Antonio, which is where I live. Right. So they're doing the same thing the fraudsters do. We're piping in their phone calls from New York and California through a local phone number. That's the part that that is a conscious effort wow. that they're doing to get the pickup rates. But I'm telling you, like I I um, I just will not work with somebody if they do that. I, I do I am disappointed in this world of Zoom info and HubSpot and all these other tools that you can use uh, as a vendor. Why you know relate to or why even go down the path of carpet bombing, the spray and pay and calling people? This is actually a good reason to have a uh, a phone number that is not in your geo, so it's not tied yeah. to you. So if you start seeing people you know call you from your your geo you're like haha you're not there's this sdr from wiz and i'm gonna call i don't remember his name a guy from wiz that called me twice and i remembered him because the name of the company is wiz and i was just like <laughs> really bad it's like dude i remember you he's like oh so so i don't they have lots of sdr so i don't know which sure. one it was but uh no i mean like come on Wait, so, okay I mean, what's 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 so bad what are they doing this wrong what's like their pitch it's all over the place. And it's like, I need your attention right now. That's the part that's right off the bat. Like you're calling it two 20 in the afternoon. I mean, if I'm a scissor or an exec or anybody we're, we're of with, with purchase authority, <laughs> like I'm probably doing stuff like the better Presumably. way, the better way to do it. I mean, like there's all these systems now that are out there that, that show buyer intent, like so-and-so we've got these searches that they're looking for this type of solution. Now, this is a true story. we, had that service and we went and looked at LinkedIn. I think it was. And we used something at the time called lead feeder, which is a glorified uh, DNS lookup. So I could tell if somebody from a URL came to our site, I couldn't tell who, but I could tell what pages 
so we get this kind of buy, it's called buyer intent, which is a fancy word for they might be asking or have an RFP out or something. But this is the cool thing that we did. And this should be done by better, other security vendors is we knew that we looked in LinkedIn by role and found a person and then saw them hitting our website. And we, our sales guy reached out to that person saying, Hey, I just want to introduce myself on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So less intrusive, not in the middle of the day and said, Hey, here's a, in case you ever need this. And sure enough, it happened to be the guy. Mm -hmm. It was a million dollar project or million dollar uh, sales for licensing. So those means exist, but like, I'm just telling you, I must've gotten 150, 200 calls in the month of August. They were just like, <laughs> you know, the other classic one is, uh, you haven't returned my call. I'm going to, I'm going to stop calling you if you don't call me back, which is like, great. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so, I mean, I'm just like disappointed in the art, I guess, so to speak of it. And that's why CISOs and certain people come the, the way they are is it's just, or they have another number that they don't answer. Yeah. So, they, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. During the pandemic, especially, right? Everyone's working from home. And uh, so phone, you don't want to pick up the phone because it's just always garbage. Yeah. Email is useless. So what works now? I mean, Ooh. I think you just, I think we just absolutely, it's sort of like when you just like rub the skin raw, like the, there's just like none of that shit works. At I'll all. tell you what works is actual thought. You know, I would say thought leadership. No, that's a bad term. I mean, you know, creativity, content, comments, things that add value. Um, what I used to tell our sales guys is always have information. Information is currency. And, you know, you have all these clients that are out here. You know kind of what they do. Hey, you ha you're working for this fast food. We're doing work for this fast food company. Hey, there's this report that came out. Send that to them and say, hey, I saw you probably saw this, but there's this thing that came out. Notice the 40% so-and-so. I mean, basically, currency if you have information that is a currency, that's a cool way to do it. You're adding value, right? Or adding, but just the, I'm calling you to call you because I need to hit my sales numbers. Is not, that's doesn't work in any context. Mm -hmm. So I think there's ways to do it. There's what, I mean, uh, and that's why to be quite candid post denim group, post coal fire, you know, talking to clients, I'm realizing there's still, there's a lot of demand for people that, that are viewed as trusted advisors, yourself included, perhaps myself and others, is because there's so much of that out there, there's so much chaff that, you know, if I can talk to the Jeremiah's of the world or Roberts of the world, I'd rather hear what they say than <laughs> like all these other people. Mm -hmm. And so back to authenticity, you know, because right. you've been in the business for a long time, you know this stuff, your your opinion is respected. Like, what's your two cents on this? Right. I mean, people ask me what I did or what I do and or did do. And I said, I'm a trusted advisor for software risk. That's how I help big companies with that realm. And I was like, okay, cool. That, I think that's like seven words, but, 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 uh, <laughs> but that I do like that when people call and say, Hey, what's your two cents? We just saw this or, Oh gosh, how do we do large language model app dev? And you know, what's the tax service look like? Um, I may not know the answer off the top of my head, but I'll, I probably, you know, have somebody that works for me or I have a an initial two cents. Mm -hmm. So the good news is on my end, the people that are at, talking to me are scissors and executives. They're not, they're not Kyle Hankins. They're not Robert <laughs> Hanson. They're not like, so I'm usually talking to them in business risk terms. And I know enough where I can have that conversation without being inaccurate. And at the same time, I'm not going to talk, go down to click jacking and SQL injections where they're just like, boo, you know, like, like, okay, cool. You know, like, I mean, I've been in a room where a CISO explained a SQL injection to a non-technical exec. And that is not a pretty moment mm -hmm. where it's like, why should I care about this? Or I've been in a room in Houston in an oil company where you're explaining like cross-site scripting errors. And they're like, that's interesting. We have a, a bunch of drilling crews in Northern Iraq that that I think we're worried about getting kidnapped by this new group called ISIS, you know? So when you talk to execs, they're worried about other risks too, not just like technical risks. Yeah. I, I have a sort of similar anecdote. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about business risk and context of, uh, of how to model it. And so one thing we came up with this, this graph, we have expected value of loss, post-compromise times likelihood, percentage of likelihood on one axis 
and cost of remediation um, pre-compromise on the horizontal. And so you, you plot everything on the graph. And uh, and so I was talking with an oil and gas company. I'm like, okay, does this model make sense? Do you agree? Blah, blah, blah. And like, let's say it's like, a, you know, an oil well blows up or whatever. And uh, it'll cost like $1,000 to fix, but it's like um, $100,000 loss or something or whatever, right? Million dollar loss. And the response was like kind of weird, like just one oil well blows up. Like what? Yeah. Why do I, <laughs> like, I don't understand. I, uh, what, are we well, ta- well. what are we talking about? Okay. And, and, you know, and then the follow up was, is there like legislation that might impact yeah, yeah, us or it, something? It, like, <laughs> I, I, okay. Like I got two, zero give a shit. <laughs> two, two real good stories about the oil and gas industry. Again, I live in San Antonio, Houston. Uh, I would say the loneliest OWASP chapter in the planet is the Houston chapter. <laughs> Uh, but true story, I've spoken at AP, the API security, which is the American Petroleum Institute uh, conference. And it's it's a very networky, as you might imagine, network security driven. But one year I was on a panel with Jeff Williams mm-hmm. and Joel Scambray, who are colleagues and they're both way smarter than me and taller and all that. <laughs> they're, uh, they're definitely particularly Jeff. Uh, <laughs> but Jeff got up and nailed it. And, and, uh, and then Joel got up and I'm like writing notes and I'm on this panel going, Wow, I I enjoy being in a panel where I'm learning things from other people. Um, and I was the last person to go. And I look out in the audience, and there's just a handful of people. Most of them are checking their phones. Two or three walked out, and I grabbed the mic and walked off the dais and walked around like a talk show host and walked around. I was like, "Look, do you realize who those guys are up there?" You know, uh, I I was just incredulous at the lack of intellectual curiosity at that session mm-hmm. it might not be reflective of all the sessions at that particular conference but i i do think that particular industry views our risk in a different way in, yes. a, in a more um you know in a, in, a, in, a, in the context of other risks or, or whatever but the last story i was going to tell wrap up the uh, oil and gas one is my sister's in the business and one of the oil refineries <clears throat> that we serviced i'll use that term and desert storm when i say serviced mm-hmm. I, I, learned what, I learned what cracking towers were in 1991 for all the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to take out all of the things. Just take out the cracking tower. Right. So we did that. Our base did and took out a, a oil refinery in a city called Kirkuk in northern Iraq. And it caused such a crazy fire that the smoke went all the way to central Iran. And at the time, we we're like, oh, my God. You know, like, yeah. like uh, of course, all the F-16 guys were like, wow. You know, uh, but... But I got to meet at my sister's office in Houston, the engineers that went back to fix that 25 years later wow. in Kirkuk. And I was like, I'm sorry. You know, was <laughs> like, uh, but, but, uh, but back to, you know, the business is those, I do think they, they view risk in a different way uh, there. And it's not always you know, like, yeah. So I had kind of a similar weird experience when I was in, um, when I was in, Ireland, which is kind of a weird place to expect to see this sort of attitude. Mm. But I went in and, and there's maybe a hundred people at the conference or something. And I'm not, maybe one or two people cared, like certainly conference organizers cared, oh, yeah. but like culturally it just, they just weren't ready to think about this or hear about it or whatever. And they're like, everyone's just looking at me, not confused, like the kind of confused where they have the intellectual curiosity and they want to like follow through more like why are we here? Kind of f- confused. Now, I, like, what is this? Like, <laughs> I, I, I've not experienced that, but I experienced this is quite a few years across back. the Irish Sea in England. Was they're much more uh, stoic, not stoic. They're less engaging than American audiences. So I, I did a lot of work over there before Denim Group, and I was there on and off for two years, once a month, for a company called Secure Logics. And I was over there, and I've talked to them, and I would get done with these meetings, and there's like, like stone face and i was like i'm dying up here what's going you know, like did you hear what i said and they're like no we heard okay cool it was, it was very little <laughs> back and forth uh there, maybe, so maybe just there more, was maybe there was some of that but i i really don't think so i think and and the conference organizers kind of echoed the point they're like yeah we're probably five to ten years behind the united states in terms of you know culture you know making this culturally understandable and like back when you used to raise your hand, like, does anyone know X technology? Like, you know, one or two mm. hands went up and then four or five years later, half the audience, their hands go up. Like they were still at the one or two hands sort of thing. I mean, I didn't experience that because I did work in London in the city and the Docklands, which is all the financials. Those guys were pretty sharp. But I mean, maybe, I mean, like. Uh, this is Dublin. This yeah, is Dublin. Dublin. I mean, this is quite a what is dump on the Irish? I have a uh, yeah. 
Cause no, I mean, I actually have no problem with them. I was just, it was just, it was the cultural difference between going from, like I, I traveled to other places, like we had big conferences in other locations, like Portugal or whatever. And like every single person there was super engaged. And like, like, so it was really just this weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair at all. Like I have a, my, no, we're co- not drinking. That no, my not cousin, <laughs> my cousin is married to an Irish woman, Neve O'Connor. Uh, and they live in Italy, but like every Irish joke, anything, if I'm in the supermarket and there's a picture of, uh, I take a picture of Irish spring or anything, <laughs> I send it to her. So like anything like that. I so see. that's not fair. Not that's fair. Not, not, Irish. not fair. Not fair. Uh, okay. So, but where do you feel like FUD does help or hurt in this marketing realm? Because it's mm. used an awful lot. Um, you know, th- my, my favorite one, I th- Maybe it's Control Scan or Scan Alert. I can't remember. One of those companies is like going in like a super hacker and, you know, Ooh, that stuff. Okay. So I don't use the word hacker in that context. I, I use attacker because I sure. uh, I don't use the word cyber at all. I mean, I say, and then that's not fair uh, because, but, but I mean, there's so much hyperbole. There's so much um, stuff. And I will say uh, that it's hard. It's back to the authenticity. There's certain things that I like out there that I'm like, okay, that's legit. That's interesting. Uh, and then there's the, you know, the white paper that like, you know, goes on and on. It's a availed solution for these guys that happens all the time. So I think sophisticated buyers can go, you know, kind of go through that. That's why they, can can we, can we pause for a second? So this whole, like not using the word hacker thing, like I'm a hacker. I know. I, I get. I, know. I get to use that word. You can. I can't. Yeah, but you can. Obviously, you can. Um, Did you just grant me authority yeah, to use it? A hundred percent. And you can listen to EDM now. <laughs> <at> like, <laughs> okay. What else? I'm, okay. I mean, no, really. I mean, I think. There, okay. There was this. There was this time, for, fairly early on, where I'm like, I felt like an, a true imposter. Like I'm a business guy at a security conference, and, and but then like. I wasn't like I ran hackers.org, H a dot CKRS.org for years. And yeah, I wrote a thousand blog posts on it. I did tons of research. Like I earned my stripes. I'm allowed to no, listen to that. I'm allowed to listen to EDM. I'm, I'm allowed to say the word hacker. And, and yeah, some people don't like that term because they think it means a certain thing. Like, no, I'm a hacker and I mean me and I mean guys like me and you know, they and might now, be on one and now me. Fence, yeah. And you, and right? I, I've been granted. Yes, uh, the, yes. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. no, I, I would be say, careful with this power here. I would say I was <laughs> the, the, yeah, be careful. Uh, I would say this mostly I was on the defense side in the, in, in the air force. And then also doing AppSec is the most defensive you know, thing you can do, right? Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I was never on the attack side, except the mentality that I had in the Air Force. My first assignment, and, and that's what I think, that uh, like ability to look at something and say, here's how I can break it. I, you know, I, I know, I do see consoles at retail places and like, I try, you know, let's try to pop a shell. No, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, like, uh, I, I do think that way that, uh, which is a break mentality. A, a, if you a, have break mentality, you are a hacker. So you may I, not be a good hacker, but you are a hacker. I am else. perhaps the worst one, uh, but, but I'm okay, matter. but it doesn't matter. And I, I don't actually agree with that. Um, I think your humility is uh, through the <laughs> roof, uh, but, uh, but no, really, I mean, I mean, I think it, it all, all stems from whether you have the intellectual curiosity and you have the basics of the skills necessary to make things happen. Yeah. Beyond that, it's just a matter of how good a hacker you are. You're still a hacker. You know, it's sort of like, are you a human being? Well, eh, yes. I mean, are you a good one? Well, you know, That's do you lay time. around eating, <laughs> eating bonbons all day? Or you get out there and do something with I life, have kids. You know? I don't lay around and do anything. <laughs> I, I, I'm driving home tonight. Yeah, no. See, you're a good human. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate that. I would say I'm intellectually curious. I think I probably spent most of my time, uh, focus on the business side because that's a hard one too. Like so many businesses oh, fail yeah, yeah, and so yeah, many, but, there's so much bad. But John, like a, a huge chunk of the security industry is the business of security. Yeah, right, I mean, right. like if it weren't for the business aspect of security, we would all still be at DEF CON talking about how cool no, it right. would be to hack into stuff or hacking into stuff and no one takes us seriously. I, you know, I, I mentioned my role as an advisor on software risk. I'd say the other thing I do a lot is help the security leaders in our clients make the business case for security, cybersecurity, cyber, whatever, before they have a near death experience. I mean, that is the the existential challenge of our, of our entire industry is how do you do this just enough before it happens? And the only time 
you know whether or not you pass is when that happens, a serious attack. And that that's really, you know, it's the same issue in the military. Do you buy more aircraft carriers or do you buy more battleships? More F-35s or more drones? You'll find you, out. You'll find out. <laughs> and, you may, and it may be a war of your, not of your choosing. And I would say that's the same thing in our realm. Totally. It's like you, the, that's why I think penetration tests, real penetration tests, not, not ASV scans right, or right, right. like real ones mimicking a sophisticated threat are probably your best like indication of how you would withstand, you know, with, with social engineering, with sophisticated stuff, you know, not 30 day, three days, not 30 days, but probably a week or two, like with a talented team right. to say, Hey, we, we got in and, you know, regardless of what your controls are, what framework you have, what I mean, framework, I mean, not dev framework. I mean, like NSF versus NIST and all. I mean, you may have your stuff compliance down to a T, but like you got nailed and, and like, that's bad. And so that's the challenge uh, in our industry right now is how do you make help your client or how does the CISO make the business case to largely a non-technical audience? Their peers. See, see, this is this is back to oh, FUD first. Yeah. Like, okay, uh, back so, to FUD. Yeah, I mean, was a bit, to your point, like FUD sells. I am back it's to sell, I'm back to FUD. Sells. I have to send you a picture, a little thing that I did. Actually, one of my guys did. He has a B-52 flying around with all these FUD bombs coming in. <laughs> carpet dropping, carpet dropping, dropping FUD. Uh -huh. But I'm back to, um, after being in it for 25 plus years, to thinking that maybe that's not a bad st strategy. I mean, I had a, my initial boss at Trident Data Systems would come in. This guy's name is Charlie Johnson. Uh, he was like this tall. And he would say, we sell fear. Remember that, boys. We sell fear. You know, go out and sell, scare the crap out of your clients and sell FUD. And it went from that to, you know, make the business case. And now I would say making the business case, the ROI model, all that stuff, that doesn't. That's, wow, maybe we're beyond that, you know, because so now what I see is this very, I, I think the, honestly, the most promising thing, I hate to say it, are external pressures, hmm. uh, supply chain pressures. You know, big buyers saying you need to do this. I'm not asking. Uh, I think some of the compliance pressures around, I mean, legal pressures, insurance, uh, insurance and cyber insurance is the other one. I'd say the other one coming is plaintiff's attorneys. And um, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, software liability, software liability. So post well, I bet everybody puts indemnification clauses in their contracts. Doesn't matter. It uh, doesn't matter. But I'm, what I'm talking about is uh, not so much software. I'm talking about company gets breached because of ransomware and, uh, and there's a, a lawsuit against the company. There's a class, there's a class action suit. Um, true story post denim group post co fire. I've been approached by and talked to two different plaintiffs attorneys firms about doing, you know, that support to them. It didn't pan out and I really wasn't my cup of tea, but it's interesting that they're thinking about it. It's very interesting. And I think that'll get the CFOs, you know, uh, attention more than whatever ROI or use case stuff you put out so there. there, there <clears throat> there's a friend of mine who was thinking about building a fund. This is pretty unethical, but it, pretty interesting too. But create a fund that basically tries to bet against companies being uh, safe. Effectively, they're going to get mm. hacked. You know what I mean? And mm. so they publish the reason why they think it is, which could be vulnerabilities or could wow. be OSN data that they found that somebody had, uh, had already breached them or you know, something beaconing out that they capture, right? So they basically become a very big OSINT mm. organization and they, and they're a, they're a fund that, that anyone can kind of follow on. They publish their, their results after they make the trade. So everyone piles on because they think there's something going on. They dump the, you know, the stock crowdsourcing. Right down. Yeah. Wow. The crowds, and, and meanwhile, people are like attacking it like crazy to get it to go down because they know it's going to go down further when it happens. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty unethical. But it also is an interesting driving force. You know, if you know that this entity is out there that's constantly monitoring everybody, looking for the, the deals because you're going to get tanked. Um, I mean, on average, the from what I've seen, I did some telemetry on this a couple of years back, but it was something like about 10% uh, degradation of valuation of their stock price for no less, for no more than 10 days. So no more than 10% oh, down. It. And they rebound. And then yeah. they rebound. But that's a, that's a pretty easy thing to, you know, routinize and turn into a, a system that you can, can make money on. So 
Yeah. I'm just saying uh, there's a pretty interesting little play in there um, where you could say, okay, here's another external pressure. Um, I mean, part of the reason that I don't want to retire is this stuff is still crazy super, interesting. It's super, super <laughs> it's interesting. Like, like, <laughs> I was like, I've always liked the spy versus spy. I've always liked the protagonist, antagonist, the fact that this is, you know, somebody on the other side trying to ruin your Friday afternoon or evening or weekend or whatever. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the most recent trends have been even more interesting. Now, I'll tell you one thing. That I, I say this over and over, <clears throat> but I, I do believe this. I tell this to attorneys. Imagine if case law and statutory law just change every five years or three, three or five years. Imagine if you're an accountant, if GAP or any type of accounting rules just change all the time, any of the SEC rules. I mean, the problem is... Well, they kind of do, though. Well, not, not, not in the velocity. We have compute models, frameworks, mm -hmm. uh, cloud computing, uh, DevSecOps. So L one of the LLMs. external pressures that you didn't say was uh, uh, just the law, because the law does change, and and many different locations have different yeah. laws, and those change, and that's I think closer to Gap. No, I th I think so, but those I mean they haven't kept up, and um, I mean got yeah. I, 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 yes, I agree. Uh, but oh, I think I accidentally ended up at a forensic accounting conference this one time, okay. which was very interesting. By the Did way, you lose a bet or what happened? Um, I can't remember how I ended up there, but it was an accident. I didn't know what I was going. It's one of those things. Someone said, you're going to be here speaking of this thing. And I showed Thank up. Thank you. I'm like, okay. Oh, wow. This is super weird and interesting. But they're like talking about just as an example of the kinds of things they talk about. It's like, well, how do you do forensics um, on a conversation when the conversation is in emojis? Like what's the forensic out? Like how do you yeah, how do you yeah. justify whatever you're actually going to take based on emojis? So very 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 interesting conference. But that was the kind of thing they're like these laws are changing so rapidly in so many different locations. You actually from a forensics perspective, you have to understand what the law was at the time in each oh, one of these yeah. regions because it all you yeah, know depends because you could have one conversation happening in one region a different you know the other half of the conversations in a different region the laws are different between those two places and. So it was a very interesting conference, despite the fact hard. that, yeah, it's yeah. very hard. Um, so it it reminds me, I know you're saying, it, I think our velocity is higher. I agree, but it's not, it's not not happening on their side. No, I, 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 I just think that, I mean, just keeping up with breach events and stories. I mean, like, or I, I can't do that anymore. I mean, like, it like just keeps happening. Well, I mean, like, hey, it's Tuesday. Hey, did you see what happened with so-and-so? Hey, like, did you see literally today? Uh, I think it was. They announced a thousand different i think it was a thousand different python packages were backdoored something I, crazy I, I was driving to austin to be in that, but that's the, <laughs> but that is like, but that's the problem that's a real thing I that happened, or okay. i forget the real number is but anyway like some th something like 10,000 uh, different companies have downloaded one of one or more of these packages and now they are compromised with some backdoor that i can't keep up with that you know what I mean? Like that's I happen to much. have read it. That's one thing. But as you said, you were driving. I'm like I have a life. I've got other things going on. I cannot. So people are like, "Oh, did you see the thing that happened with such and such company?" I'm like, I don't know. What you're no, I mean, we're you're pretty connected. I'm pretty connected. We it's follow this stuff things. pretty close. I, you know, and it's still like you know, I, I heard from a friend that's not technical at all. It's like, hey, did you see about the Chinese this week? And I was like, <laughs> could you be more specific? <laughs> but I Google, I was like, yeah, there's some very specific threats. And I'm like, okay, cool. That didn't make it in any of my feeds. I'm like, right. yeah. So, I mean, like, I do enjoy this. Are you talking about that Fox News thing? That I don't even know about the PLA, uh, more PLA stuff where they were, like, in theory, deeply in the yeah, infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was okay, Fox okay, News. Yeah, they yeah, they okay. did this massive thing. I got the same query. Is this real? I'm like... <sighs> What, Maybe. what, what real, which, what well, are we talking we about? Won't like know. what, what part? Well, no, I mean, it is happening, but the way they phrased it, it made it kind of sound like it was happening today. But then if you dig into the reporting, they're mm. like, oh, it's been happening for the last year. I'm like, well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> that part's true. I would assume that they have but, hooks everywhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah. I, you know, so I enjoy that part. I, um, you know, the, um, we talked about this briefly, but like the AI thing right now is an entire like okay. Rabbit Let's hole. Do it. Let's um, do it. What do you feel? Is it uh, is it the real threat people are worried about? Is it not an issue? Where you land? I uh, I mentioned Adam Shostak. I would throw in Diana Kelly and a bunch of other people that I've known for a very long time who I deeply respect. And I think almost to a person, they said a couple of things. This is at Black Hat this this past year, where they said maybe the biggest thing since the internet. I mean, big. Still trying to figure it out. I get my head wrapped around it 
um, which is like everybody. And so <clears throat> it is, it is evolved so rapidly that is everything we just talked about from a you know breach standpoint, but, but just like the technology is so crazy fast now that it is, there's like 10 to 20 announcements a day. At day. Least. And so I, um, I, and ironically, the, I don't know if you've seen the AI Dilemma uh, YouTube video by the the guys that did the AI, excuse me, the Social Dilemma Netflix show. Uh, they're quite bright computer scientists out of Silicon Valley. And their whole premise, and I believe it to be true, is that the there's like eight or nine companies that are competing, you know, and they're mostly in the West Coast, Seattle, San Francisco, and, and in China. <clears throat> and these eight or not seven or eight, depending on how you count it, companies are just throwing capabilities out with no thought about their implication. 100%. Uh, and, and I think that is true. Uh, I well, I know it's true. I also... I mean, half of it's broken. That too. So I think that's interesting. I do believe it is hard to understand for many. And one thing I've... So I did this thing, you know, at the start of the year, I just left coal fire. I'm like, what am I going to do in 2023? I'm going to learn AI. You know, how's and, that going? And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a whole it's, year. <laughs> it, uh, it's it's going. So uh, no, I'm not joking. Don't like. No, I don't. I need, get to, I get to joke. Uh, uh, I'll say no <laughs> nasty text from Jeremiah or Jeff Williams or any of those guys. No, so I don't mean I'm never going to be a data scientist, nor do I want to be uh, that or AI guy hardcore. But I was like, you know, I do think this thing is you know post uh, Chat GPT, Open AI. Wait, 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 why not? What's that? Why not? Why don't you want to get in? This is. No. Th this is the wild west. This is like getting in the very ground floor. Let, let me finish my thought. Okay. I, I don't, right. uh, I do want to get into it, but from a standpoint of figuring out what's interesting and what's not. And from a business standpoint, That's probably, right. uh, versus being an actual machine learning guy. Mm -hmm. But here's what I learned. So I, so I went and took this MIT class this summer where it's like, Oh, it's online 3000 bucks, you know, like, uh, and what I learned is you pay 3000 bucks. At least if I do, I'm going to learn this stuff. It, it, absent of paying 3000 bucks, I would yeah. still be on my to-do list. Right. But as soon as I commit resources, like, Oh, I'm all in now. And I realized that there's a learning curve big time. And, and so I'm not a developer and I'm not a, a data scientist by background. <clears throat> and what I realized is that they're, they're throwing terms out real fast methods, vectors, mm -hmm. you know, things that I'm like, okay, 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 okay. I ended up having to go back and learn a bunch of stuff that was around me at Denim Group, but I just didn't know very well because I had Dan Cornell, I had Kyle Hankins and all those other smart people, Cap Diebel, all these other guys were like, here, okay. But so if you're not a data scientist, if you're not a machine learning per person, which uh, if you're not a developer architect, there's a big learning curve, which is most of security people. If you're a you know, network security person or if you're a compliance person, Wow, there's a lot to learn because you don't even you can't even conceptualize. At least I understand TCP/IP really well in Unix, and the OSI model as a starting point in some modicum of data science, and it's still hard to understand. Particularly the you know the the, the LLM stuff. It's like you're creating something from nothing. How are you doing that? You know, so it's a bit mind bending. I figured that out. I think it is quite interesting. I mean, like like beyond interesting. And that MIT class I took was quite cool. It stopped well short of chat GPT and open AI and they mentioned the future. So it is crazy dated. So the other thing I've learned is most of the good stuff out there isn't in academia at all. It's online or the vendors are putting it out, Microsoft, Google, and all these others. Mm -hmm. It's just going so fast. And so like one of the things I'm, and, I, and, mm. well, yeah, yeah, it's going fast and also it's garbage. Mm. It is absolutely, they're not even spell checking anymore. They're just so, like, fuck it. Just get this out now. Because well, maybe, they don't have time. Yeah, maybe they, yeah. Which, which just gives you some sense of how few, I mean, Microsoft or Apple or these guys, these are normally like ultra polished. If you go look at the library mm. that uh, Apple just produced, uh, MLX, I think it's called, something like that. It is misspelled. Functions don't work right. Like half the stuff doesn't compile correctly or just errors out on current, current most updated Macs. Like it's awesome. Just, it is absolutely hot garbage. And this is coming from a company who like Steve jobs would like throw those people in the trash by himself, like physically throw them, like pick them up and throw them in the trash. If that, if they let that out the door on his watch, but I don't think they have time. Like they're just like, they got to go so fast. They got to keep up. Uh, that is, so that, that idea is, that is not great if you're talking no. about something that could kill us all. 
and, and, and I think that again, the guys from the AI dilemma have this quote that they pull that's like fifty percent of AI scientists think there's a ten percent chance that AI will, you know, drive our ex- extinction absent of some control or something like that, which is pretty dystopian. Um, that's my, high. That's pretty high. I mean, that, but, that, but but okay. But the other thing is, does, are they saying that about? a unified AGI or are they saying that about every possible AGI that anyone anywhere creates? Yeah. I mean like, because that's, <clears throat> that's a lot of threat actors out there. And I think that if you go back and look at that thing and it, it's on YouTube, ironically, my wife was the one that said, Hey, have you seen this yet? So like part of this thing right now is letting people like know that I am interested in app security and AI mm-hmm. And then now I'm getting all these like, oh, cool. Yeah, I missed that. I'm on, I've, I'm on all these lists. I'm all this stuff, but there's so much happening. You know, I got something from Dan the other day. It's like, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, from Cornell. And so there's, there's just so much happening. You may not know, but I'm writing a book on AI. I, there you go. All right. I know now. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I, I have Sam Altman's uh, uh, phone number from a previous life Sweet. and uh, so <clears> I texted him and told him about it. And I don't think he could give even one shit about it. So, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, always, always if, you don't get, if you don't want to get in front of this, well, I mean, it's not particularly flattering of where open AI is. I mean, like look, look at their homepage right now. It says something like, um, like we're building AGI for every human on the planet or for all of humanity or something. It's like, do you really mean all of humanity? Do you really mean every single person is going to be unaffected negatively do you mean that there is no zero sum games at all yeah, that can't I mean, be solved like, by AGI? That sounds incredibly naive, like incredibly naive. Like, I would have given, I don't know how much money, but a lot of money to be there that weekend on the firing and rehiring and all that <laughs> stuff. <clears throat> Cause I'm sure some of that came into play. Obviously it did. Uh, I would say this, the thing that motivates me now is how do we use the forces of good you know, people like yourself and others and, and, and get there quicker with this than the other guys weaponize it. That's what a key thought is driving me right now is how do I, and that's that's why I was probing you about why not? Because I feel like your head and mine and a bunch of other people who are maybe even more, much more technical than I am. And in this area, this, this nuance, this niche, um, it's all hands on deck, man. We got it's get, all hands on deck. So we so, got to get everybody focused on this problem. And, and this is actually a conversation I'm going to have with my wife next week. Uh, is you plan out your conversations a week in advance with your wife? No, I'm trying to choreograph <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> no, not on this stuff. I see, I see. Uh, no, there's too many things. We got kids. You got plans for the other days. So. No, <laughs> just fucking. There's you. too many. Uh, <laughs> no, it, and it's the why I can't. I don't want to retire and it's not, you know, we did, we were did particularly well with this acquisition, you know, blind squirrel finds nut and, you know, thank you, coal fire. Thank you everybody. Uh, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. So it's not about that. And I've gotten that. Like, why would you do this? Why do you need to do this? And I was like, it's all hands on deck. It's like, I don't think with a straight face, I can look at everybody and say, I'm gonna go play golf. or I'm going to go hang out or do no, you know, we know too much. We're kind of at the, height of our careers we know a lot of people and on top of that we have a entire generation of people that have worked with us that i think you know listen to us and are influenced and clients that are like hey what's your take on this what's your take on llms and apps app dev and it's like it wasn't even a topic 12 months ago no and it's now like well not really i mean not materially yeah, yeah true and so true. so the point being is that um I would also argue this because of that learning curve. And, and again, I, I, I've said this publicly, so I don't mind saying it. And again, the technical folks will uh, probably quote me on this. I've said I'm a 1.5 on a scale of one to 10 on, on the, on AI right now, <clears throat> being able to talk about it in business terms, being able to describe it, neural networks, large language models. Uh, I am maybe a two trying to be a 2.5 uh, to be able to do two things. Number one, identify, you know, technologies that are like, okay, that's pretty darn cool versus hyperbole. Um, or and, and the utility of those, the models. utility and then, or a business model where I'm like, this is so cool. I'm going to hop back in and do it. So I'll tell you this. And I don't, I, I don't think you knew this or, but I did a peer to peer discussion at RSA in 2019 called how to vet vendor claims around AI. 
Mm. It was a lot of fun. So it wasn't a presentation, which was good because I didn't know enough about it at the time. But I did know enough where I could facilitate. And we had 40 people in a room. Three or four people carried that conversation. And there were three things that came out of it. It was a wonderful conversation. And number one, at the time, it was mostly machine learning, no lar large language models. Number one, uh, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> if the vendor doesn't have a white paper, don't listen to them or anything written about it because it's a me too. The second thing was um, that doing a proof of concept is quite difficult with any large language model or at the time any machine learning because getting a good data set is actually quite difficult to prove the point. And the thirdly, mm. the killer question was this. And let's use synthetic data. But Unless, and then that, that's, yeah. yeah. It's a whole other so the, then the last question, which I loved and committed to memory was, this is the question you asked the vendor. How does your AI or machine learning algorithm differ from hard-coded rule sets? How? How does it do that? And I applied that uh, at RSA and Black Hat several times since. And I can't get anybody to answer that question in the booth. And so they're like, oh, the product manager left. Oh, you know, that person's not here. And I did this again at Black Hat. How? Is, can I talk to your guy? I saw, I saw that you had that it's AI-powered EDR or AI-powered so-and-so or my favorite term is AI infused mm -hmm. kind of like, <clears throat> like if you're going to the massage envy or massage height, <laughs> what, what infusion would you like? I like the large language model infusion tonight <laughs> or, or, or the, you know, like, like, uh, so, so, but I went around asking, okay, cool. You make this claim. Just tell me how. And I, I got it one time from a product manager, I think at IBM who said, Oh, here's how we do false positive identification and reduction. I was like, Oh, okay. This is for, I think SAST at the time. You know, we look at patterns activity, da, 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 we capture this. And I'm like, okay, that's 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 a good answer. That was the exception. Every other time I've asked that question, and I think it's getting better, but the next time you go to RSA or Black Hat and you see, you know, the Me Too AI claim. Okay, but do you think that that was the sales rep on the floor, or do you think that they really just don't know? And they're just I don't think they had anybody in the booth that do. Okay. And so I would say, hey, is there anybody here, a product manager or anybody, a leadership yeah. person that well, knows that's, this answer? That's kind of, that might be a different issue. I know, and it's not uh -oh. fair, but 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 like you're going well, to it's market. Not, with it's not that. unfair. It just uh, it just might not be proving the thing you're actually trying to prove. But I think you're absolutely your instincts are correct though, um, because you actually talk to the actual engineers and you'll get some of these weird, fluffy answers. And you're like, but you know, like like if uh, but, you know but what you're again that that particularly one on AppSec was a great answer, which is here's how we this is the one area we're trying to attack is false positives, false positives, which is a ginormous problem with scanners in AppSec, yeah, right? For sure. Um, so one of the things that I've come to realize too in the last six or seven months in this journey is if in order to accrue any benefit in any company you can't just be a data science guy and like drop into a company because you don't even know the context. You don't even know what an EDR is or AppSec or DAST or SAS or anything. So you actually have to be a subject matter expert and a AI person, mm -hmm. right? In order to even identify or characterize the problems. And that's the lack right now. So, yeah, so I think that's the area, this argument that most of those people live in those eight or nine companies, I think is the case. What about the vast unwashed masses in the flyover states, Texas and us? And where do they Calling live? Texas a flyover state? Yeah, I, on, I mean, if you're from California, <laughs> I'm being I'm being facetious there because uh, it is. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, I would just point out we gained two congressional seats. <laughs> at the, at the, no, just uh, sorry, California. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, um, I think those people have gone to those places and they perhaps don't exist in other places like corporate America and other. And so this is ginormous demand. So now you have the hype and really what I'm trying to figure out in this journey is like, can I discern wheat from chaff in AI and ML? Okay. ML. So, so I think to exacerbate what I think you're getting at here. So we already had a problem of security people not being very good at security. <laughs> and now we're going to ask them to do two things for yeah. which they've <clears> never <throat> touched AI. And they're only sort of good at security. And now they've got to be good at both. And the chances of these vendors hiring. So I think vendors in general, and this is definitely not true all the all places. The and, and it's certainly not even true necessarily in every company. But the vast majority of people working within vendors are not security people. They're the not. The vast majority. They're not 
In fact, they probably don't know literally anything about security, which is very scary. They're just kind of along for the ride. They're just, you know, there's a random business person and they're doing product management and they, you know, they're kind of thrust into it and they're trying to figure it out as they go. They might have worked at a security company one time before or yeah. something, but that's it, right? And so they're looking for the adults in the room, but they don't exist anymore. Like half the guys are retired, you know, they're off doing other stuff, you know, they're starting their own companies, you know, they're, they're doing other stuff they, or they moved out of security entirely. You know, they're doing other completely Didn't other things. Didn't you uh, do a speech at AppSec Cali <laughs> about that? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did. And it, that was right when I left coal fire. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, no, that was good. And your point, if I remember correctly, was, you know, a lot of these people have left and, uh, have had their companies acquired or do something. It was like, wait a second, are you talking about you and me? At I the am time? talking about you and, and me. And, uh, but, but back to where we are really a year and a half later, no, we don't have the luxury to like play golf. No. It's a bad example, but, but, but to, to do something different. And um, because you know too much, you know, you can sort at least the puffery from things that are authentic. And I think that's the, the important part. And, you know, I just, one of my friends was going to retire after an acquisition and I'm looking at him and I'm like, no, he's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to retire. This is it. I'm done. You know, I made a plenty of money. I'm fine. I'm done. I'm like, nope. Well, <laughs> like you're not. Well, I, it's not that you can't, yeah. it's just that you aren't. And you might think you are right now. Maybe that's even like your plan. Six months from now, you and I are going to be talking about what your next project is. And sure enough, you know, I, I think um, you just can't sit still. If you if you've got the entrepreneur spirit, it's very difficult to to finally just sit, hang up your spurs and say, F yeah, "I'm done." And this is not the time to do it. Like if if we were all like peacetime and everything's that's it. golden, fine. I, yeah, I, maybe. I think um, we're just not there. These are all talking points that you must have gotten from my wife. To some degree. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, no, it, there's some truth to that. There's this. I have a camera in your house. So. Yeah, like, well, uh, yeah, that was another episode <laughs> about the, the monitoring stuff. I, I listened to that one. No, um, I think you're right. If it were just, there is this engine that you have. If you're a business person or an entrepreneur or whatever, that you just go, 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 go. But you can, you can put that in different things. And and one Good. thing that I can definitely say that I've done the last year is I have definitely addressed a lot of technical debt with my family. I mean, to use a, a IT term and I'm, I feel a lot better uh, that, that way because the truth was for a long time at dinner group, uh, it was without boundaries. We flew all over the place, Singapore, as I mentioned, all these places. Uh, I think that, you know, anything I do in the f going forward is going to have a lot of constraints and a lot of different things. Cause you know, I, 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 um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be divorced. I don't want to have kids that are messed up. That's I did, that just came out. You know, I'm sorry, uh, but I don't want. I mean, like, and it's as we all know, like, like you get into the company, and it's without boundaries, and that's what I keep saying. So I'm trying to figure out a if model. If you're good at it, if you're good at it, I'm, and it's consuming, it can be consuming, mm -hmm. and it's a crazy ego stroke when you get a call from a CISO that's like, you know, running a company that's worldwide recognized. It says, I need your help on this. The answer is hey, absolutely yes. Absolutely. You know, that's <laughs> why I try that, By the that's way, what that's we're what, here for. That's the way a reason I don't do IR. I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah, and I, I did that. For oh, a while. that's I mean, rough. And, and I, and the that variation was like Christmas Eve of my oh, life gone. They, none of these, <laughs> none of these attacks happen like a Monday morning no, at 10. No. It's Friday evening. I actually still have a go bag, which I need to decommission, but I would get the variation as like, I know you don't do IR, but I need your help. I'm like, ah. Oh, you know, so I've, I've, I've done some very crazy situations, so I'm, I'm familiar, oh, yeah. but, um, I mean, there's a lot to be said about how awful all of those situations are, but in the end, you know, a lot of people are way better off because I was willing to pick up everything and go and do some crazy thing yep. in the middle of the night and the weird austere situation he or is whatever. He, it doesn't have to be you all the yeah, time you know be true another person uh that looks like you uh yeah i mean uh there, there is something to sit, be said about not being the firefighter all the time all the time i mean like and that's so looking at what's next i'm trying to figure out a model where it's not all about one person or two or three people is like how do you do a, a distributed model and uh 
I think that's important. I mean, because it is a long game, too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you want to do it longer, you also can't get burned out. And I know other people in other positions like mine did get burned out, you know, or, or hit a wall or make a bad decision or do whatever. So, you know, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at. But I do think what we're doing is so needed right now that it's, yeah. I don't think it's going away. And this AI stuff, I mean, AI... Uh, prompt injection, for instance, is exactly like SQL injection, only like ten times harder to protect against. Yeah, I, I mean, so, like, like it, it didn't exist. Yeah, it didn't that exist. Long ago. I mean, like, I'm there's an OWASP top ten for LLMs. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, like that that is stuff that didn't exist thirteen months ago. I know. You know, like, like so, so it's pretty cool, but it, it is a learning curve. And you know, like I said, I, 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 I didn't. I mean, I think the people that retire or in certain types of jobs that they just don't like. And it's like, oh, there's a the finish line. I never want to do that. And uh, I think what I do going forward has to have a higher purpose. And I think this stuff around AI and security is pretty close to that. So, you know, because the dystopia angle, I'm not even talking about the Chinese versus the U.S. and AI, that too. I mean, uh, there's a good book I read, uh, one of the many this, this summer about AI superpowers, you know, like, like, and you read that going, wow, okay, you know, that also is dystopian, you know, a bit between those two, our two countries. And um, so, are, are you yeah. personally worried about AGI or what, what do you think is the major problem with AI from a security perspective, a global pers security perspective? I mean, the initial take is just automated uh, exploits, like doing exploits real fast. Mm -hmm. If something's found, bam. And it, I mean, exploit writing, as you know, is, is, can be involved, you know, but now it's like, you know, easy to find, easy to do. And that, 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 so that worries me. So the cycle time, mm -hmm. the OODA loop to use an Air Force term is like real fast, yeah. you know? Uh, <clears throat> and again, we never solved AppSec. We never solved all these other things. And now we're just going faster. Compute models different. And you're right. You're asking people who may not know it very well already to learn like data science and stats. It's math, math, you know, like, oh, I didn't, you know, you're not a math person. Well, you know, you so better learn in a hurry. But I, yet I still think I, I have very low confidence in most security people call themselves security people who are working in security companies. I have very low confidence and it's gotten, I think it's gotten worse is the problem. I mean, the average IQ has probably gone down. Well, I was just a lot of, in, there's a lot more entrance, yeah, but, but there are still, yeah, I, don't, I don't, I wouldn't use the word IQ. I think these are well-intentioned and bright people, of course. but they're just new, you know? And, no, and, I, that's what I meant by IQ is uh, security IQ. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. like they don't know. And I'll, and some of this is experience. I mean, it's just flat out experience. And I'll give you a great example from air force times. So we, um, we had one base we were looking at. And so one of the things we would do is look at the same bases all the time. Like I would get three or four Air Force bases. And so you like manually do this, but you would get to know, like, here's how much traffic they have. Here's what they have. Boom, 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 boom. And I remember one day coming in and it was like off the, off the charts traffic. And it's like, what happened? And we're looking at this and we noticed that it's all outbound traffic to a particular host. We look at the host IP, we look at that, it's a local bank. And it's like, what the heck? It's like, it looks like we're attacking, like AF.mil is attacking this local bank. And we call the base and they figured out <clears throat> local local administrator of Moonlighting running, a, uh, at the time, NMAP against uh. the local. <laughs> so you have to kind of build up those experiences. And I just remember the first time I installed a firewall, like in the 90s, and seeing all the outbound traffic, <clears throat> it was like port 135 through 139, mm -hmm. all the outbound traffic trying to get to the internet, all the, the Windows, uh, BIOS, NetBIOS, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, there's all these packets trying to get out the the internet to the internet. And that was one of my guys, this is like, again, early 90s, mid-90s, saying, John, that's the other reason you have a firewall, is to keep all those packets inside your network. I was like, oh, okay. So like some of that is experiencing it and seeing it and seeing anomalies and seeing weird stuff and like, why would you do that? You well, you wouldn't. That's what attackers do. You know, as I like to say, attackers are not constrained by conventions, by, you know, the the normal protocols. <laughs> oh. Exact opposite, you know. And they have a lot of <clears throat> uh incentives to uh -huh. get better and in ways that are harmful to us. Exactly. Yeah, I um I think about that uh, speed up thing quite a bit, um, and there's mm. some there's some really interesting. I actually developed a prototype, um, and I could get down to 0.02 seconds to compromise. 
Um, and that's that's faster than you can even log into the machine. So mm. the, the login, yeah. login D is slower than my exploits. Uh, like full, like take an exploit, reverse it, change it, add my own payload, mm. fire it off. And I, in fact, it was so fast, I had to get rid of the command and control infrastructure because that was slowing it down. Wow. Um, like I was running into speed of light issues, getting the packets from where the machine was to my host here to decide whether I was. Yeah, you know, it sounds like Wall Street high speed trading it problems. Was. It, it, no, it was. <laughs> like, uh, it was. I was getting down to speed of light uh, issues. It was actually slower to have command and wow. control sitting off host. So I had to put everything right there. And, um, and what's crazy in that world, in that same world, we have companies that don't patch very well. Yeah, that's true. Or they don't do access control particularly well. I mean, that's incredible. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit since I think <laughs> similar similar thing. What do you think about uh, like SCADA systems and the, uh, uh, the things we all rely on to run everything, like water, power, gas, everything? I don't think we'll know until we really know. To you, to say it in an ominous way, I don't think it really like the, the analogy that I threw out earlier about the military. Just, just colonial pipeline as an example, we knew uh, about that one. Yeah, I mean, what I mean by we don't know the full implication of the vulnerabilities until they're exploited uh, in a mass way. And I would argue this: I've I've done a lot of presentations, a lot of work in the electrical industry, le- uh, local utilities specifically, <clears throat> and. Um, what I found there is the threat for them remains abstract. They talk about you know, infrastructure and all this stuff, and they have NERC and FERC, and they do all these different things. They're all well-meaning, but they don't have the financial loss that the big banks and the big, you know, the big providers have. They just don't. And the reason for that is the, the threat actor is really a nation-state, and the nation-state actors have yet to play that card. They haven't. And that's the big question of why, why, why haven't they? <clears throat> I would argue three reasons. Number one, those in glass houses, you know, I, I'm most certain our offensive capabilities uh, have hooks into their systems. You turn ours off, we'll turn yours off. Number two, um, I mean, like, as soon as that happens, we will overreact. And it, it, you can't do it a second time the, to that scale. And the third reason is probably the maybe the strongest one. It's an act of war because people will die. Uh, Josh Corman will talk about hospital systems getting interrupted, but it's across the board. Uh, so even though laws of armed conflict are not really as well defined in the cyberspace as they are in the physical space, it is broadly and assumed if you turn off stuff, people will die. That is likely a act of war. The only caveat is, as we know, you know, Attributing that to a certain actor is particularly difficult, particularly the sophisticated ones. And I learned that 25 years ago in the Air Force is like, hey, here's this attacker from the so-and-so technical school in this threat country. And, you know, like, no, it's not a big deal. It's like their students running, you know, a scanner. The ones that you have to worry about are the ones that are coming from the library in Reykjavik that are bouncing from the home office in Darmstadt that are, you know, the ones that are three or four hops down which are the really good ones, right? The the ones that know how to cover their tracks. And so that's that's what worries me is that, that there hasn't been a real, except for Crimea in 2014 uh, and now in Ukraine, there hasn't been that happen over here. But I think there's a broad sense within the certain parts of the community that this is going to happen. Uh, and, you know, my, my effort has been to hopefully it doesn't happen in this part of the grid or happen somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably if someone really wants to do it, they could do it. Um, whether they use a little bit of kinetic um, or all cyber, I think it's it's unfortunately it's a pretty soft target. No, and I, I would and, say and this, and it's big and it doesn't move. It's <laughs> easy no, to find. I mean, like, like it is. Um, first of all, I think the electrical grid is probably the perhaps that and penicillin are to the two big creations of the 20th century. I mean, like we have electricity everywhere. I've, you don't, you may or may not know this, but the rural electrification process was, project was a big deal in the 40s and 50s here. You go to the hill country, when Lyndon Baines Johnson grew up, there wasn't electricity in the hill country right over here, not too far from here. So, I mean, the grid is a spectacular thing, but it is not like, it is not infallible. It's not indestructible, quite the opposite. Uh, 
the the challenge is, as I mentioned, is again the threat hasn't played that card, and as a result, there's I think a false sense of security. My argument has been the winter storm Yuri in Texas now two and a half three years ago was an indicator that like wow we you know we're not ready that was an act of nature uh, act of God whatever you want to say but it wasn't a man made deal a man made one would look quite different and I would say the non the attribution component makes it even much more attractive so like if I'm doing something across the Straits of Formosa and I'm in Beijing, um, wow, that I could probably do that to keep us pinned down over here because you couldn't attribute it. Um, and I would point to one other thing. If you notice this public in San Antonio, you can Google this. They are, the DOD is doing a geothermal project, I think at Lackland Air Force Base now, as a secondary form of of electricity for resilience. And they're doing that at Yokota Air Base in Japan. So it's not a very public thing, but they are most certainly making sure that they're not entirely dependent on their local provider for good reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one other thing I want to add there, the reason I feel that way is, you know, the benefit of being a consultant is you look at lots of companies and we looked at lots of electrical companies, not just the regional ones. <clears throat> and our indication of badness was the time to get in. And it was typically very quickly. And it was typically with automation and typically by junior members of the pen test team mm -hmm. versus other clients who were on. I, I remember one or two clients where they were real, real good. And this is not scanning. I mean, this is like hardcore penetration, you know, red team penetration stuff. And at the very end, I think we were up there, you know, with many of them, one of the, one of the best ones. And I remember two or three instances where we didn't get any surface area with these, these uh, clients. And we're like in week two in the whiteboard with Dan and me and others. I'm like just observing <laughs> more than anything else, but literally trying to figure out, okay, we got nothing. What do we do here? How do we, how do we get in? And we typically we find re, uh, a way Compare that on one bookend to some of the ones in these uh, utilities where it's like day two, intern, Nessus, open port. That's the part that's that scares me the most is there there's this weird mix of sophisticated threat actor who has yet to play that card and a largely not ready entity. Um and again, that's the benefit of being a consultant. You see all these different environments. We would see bank environments and we see that. And it's just like, wow, big difference. Big, big difference. I mean, if China has, you know, agents on the ground, which of course they do, every you know, that's what we do is we send spies to other countries. That's what other countries do. I have no idea what you're talking about. Us. No idea. <laughs> no. Um I mean, the the fact that they thinking that they don't have kinetic answers to that too. No, I'm not uh, even talking to these problems. Like the thing I say about kinetic though, here's that's a, uh, a harder problem. Like uh, if you're an attacker, so let me put my air force nodal analysis thing. Why would you go after a transformer? I mean, that's the, the domestic terror threat right now is a you know, 50 caliber, put a couple rounds and you knock it out. Yeah, that's bad. But the grid is used to that because that happens with thunderstorms and, and major events. I mean, like the one thing that the grid operators are really, really good at, they're, uh, first of all, they're great at keeping the grid up, almost 99.99%. They're also really good when they have regional events. They have all these interlocal agreements. So like if there's a hurricane that hits uh, Houston, they're going to be about 100 bucket trucks that go east from San Antonio and Austin and different places. They already have these contracts done. They know what to do. The interesting thing is they all standardize on a similar electrical uh like everything's the same there, right? So you don't have a different electrical system and connectors and stuff in Houston. So when they send massive bucket trucks, and this happened in Florida last summer, we sent people from San Antonio to there. That's pretty cool. That is a sophisticated and well-oiled uh, mutual aid yeah, situation. But but, it but imagine there's, call it minimum, three, three uh, agents per major city or something that could fire a gun at transformers to use your example. Um, I wouldn't waste an agent on that. If I'm an, if I'm I, those guys, if I, I, I would, if you have an agent, unless they're a throwaway agent, I would but use I mean, them for better things. Yeah. But, 
but they could be throwaway agents um, and in coordination with much bigger attack going on. Right. You I, would, I'm not, I'm not going to go into some of the more dystopian scenarios, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the great example. But, but what I'm saying is you do that enough places in enough different locations. Like you just, there aren't enough people to go and fix all of no, those issues. You do, you do it once and you talk about it. I mean, give you, I'll give you a great, a great example. And I've said this privately, but not publicly. You know, I guess I'll say it publicly. Sure. Uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda have been, very without power for a very long time. You know, uh, here's why, because you would send your least talented agents here to do one thing and go, go to a natural gas pipeline in Houston or go anywhere and do one thing. And then say, this is going to happen every day and just like, and just scare the poop out of everybody. And the overreaction, we'd have TSA for pipelines, you know, like, 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 there's so many different things that they could do to really scare us into doing different things. I, I, I think if I were on their side, if I had a, a local agent, I would not waste them on something like that. I would get them t- to hire a knucklehead to do it, a, a, a carve out to use a term. Sure. You know, somebody else to contract it. Yeah. But there, there but, but, but again, the weak part of the grid is not transformers or these, it's the generation cap- capability. That's the part. Uh, that whole but that, that also is vulnerable to kinetic as well. That's 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 the bigger problem challenge is yeah. the creation, not the distribution part, not the interfaces. And the reason for that, the reason that why that's such an interesting area <clears throat> or risky area is we don't have extra generators laying around. There's not a warehouse in Austin that has extra generators. And as a matter of fact, they're probably manufactured more like they are aircraft carriers, where you know Siemens knows or GE knows. And so um, if those were to go out in any which way, the likelihood that they would be replaced soon. And you know, the more likely scenario is not kinetic. I would say it's. Yeah. Not you, more you, likely. You, well, maybe you, a combo. You break in, run them hot, cut off remote access. Yeah. So, and the grid operators know that too. So uh, I think they're quite aware of that but the same thing with water i mean you we're focusing on electricity but water yeah same, so, same 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 kind of deal and water has another issue which is pollution or you know yeah. poisoning or whatever so you have those issues um i mean all of these critical infrastructure even roadways i mean they're all they're all just broken in a very now way that is exploitable my point is as an attacker you do it once and exploit it through Information operations. Yes. Over and over and over. Like this is, we're going to do this again. And Oh, we, Oh, you know what I would do? Well, I'm not going <laughs> to, I, I would put three or four inert bombs in other places and do this and just say, here's more. And then like, cause you remember you're old enough to remember you're September 11th. You're an adult when September 11th happened mm-hmm. or modestly an adult. Yes, I, was, I, was, I was actually working adult. in security at the okay. time. <laughs> so if you remember what happened that afternoon of September 11th, there were rumors that there were more aircraft coming and more, they were discovering well, another there, crew. There was, there was, yeah. I mean, there was, and there was one. another one. And there was other, they found another guy and all, I mean like yeah. it was, but the point being is like, they didn't know where all these crews were. I mean, uh, you can, when that some things like that happen, you know, I'm a, I'm a actually a trained psychological warfare guy. I've been done like there is a more eloquent, eloquent and leveraged way to do that. If you're an attacker. Well, there was a <clears throat> uh, follow on anthrax um, envelopes delivered oh, yeah. as well. So that was part of the psyops, which is funny for a totally different reason. I randomly wrote a very similar write up on, on what I would do to um, to mess up the United States to some reporter like 10 years earlier. And I went mm-hmm. back and I found, I actually had this email and I sent it to the guy. I'm like, look at this thing. I like, I even said the word anthrax in there. I'm like, look, it's like almost exactly, except I was talking about uh, attacking infrastructure, like a, like a bridge or something as opposed to a building. But um, I've actually thought about wondering if there's a, a, like an Edward Snowden kind of person that would do that and sacrifice their, whatever, you know, their, themselves to prove that point because i do think it's really bad on the infrastructure side and i do think the difference between they what they say they do and what they actually do is 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 breathtaking at times i mean we almost don't need it because in texas we've had two massive power outages in the last yeah uh, three, well they're already three, predicting three this years. winter and that's you know that's they're already that's another issue. And, and heat waves. And California and, has know. similar issues. Brownouts. I mean, we're we're like this far no, away from I mean, breaking like, already. Like my point being is that 
uh, the grid was viewed as something that was ubiquitous and never and infallible, and it is most certainly not the case uh, here or anywhere else. I mean, it is a thing, and like many systems, when you have major events like Winter Storm Uri was unprecedented. I looked it up. The last time that there was that length of cold weather in our t- state was 1952, 70 years. So off the charts, you know, black swan type of event. But if you have a protagonist, then it even gets nuttier and crazier. And that's that's just, you know, an important thing. And I, and I would argue that nation state threats and their tactics and their approach, their TTPs, whatever you want to call it, include that. And they might have been things that happen to other people, Ukraine, Gaza, and other. But no, they are more they they are more central to what could happen here. And you see it from time to time. So, uh, and then, and the kind of the, the, the warnings, I mean, I don't know if you saw this earlier the year, uh, this year when NSA came out and said, Oh, by the way, uh, <clears throat> if you have supply chains in Taiwan, you should be doing war game or you should be doing tabletops. I think is what they said. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like you're getting more and more like these type of warnings that the warning came out in April of 2021 from the white house about the grid specifically and it was like whoa what do you know that we don't know you know how how realistic is this threat so i i i think it went from science fiction and theoretical to like an actual scenario i mean Um, we've been talking about this for a long time the cyber pearl harbor i mean i think to some extent colonial pipeline was not that but a nice little preview you know like a power outage that lasts a week or whatever it was like like I mean, it was uh, a it was a disruption to supply chain that 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 was not painful. In, in from the it wasn't as painful as Winter Storm Yuri was here. I mean, we were we had yeah, that's true. Tens of millions that were out of power and out of water with no nothing, and people died. Lots of people died. Um, I mean, I, you lived through it. You were here. I was in San Antonio. I was like, wow, this this made the pandemic look like child's play. I I, mean, I was, uh, I was, I happened to be on part of the grid that was, you know, critical services or whatever. So, Oh yeah. It was that we managed to stay on power for the first like three or four days and the last day or whatever. It was random. Like people next to you were out. So I, uh, the one story that I have, like it was day two, I think it started like Sunday night. It was like Tuesday. Our ups, our backup stuff at denim group, started to die after like two days or 72 hours or whatever. So I, I made the decision <clears throat> that I'm going to drive to it to see how denim group is doing the office. And we had just bought a house on the far North side of San Antonio. So see, check out our house. And I was like, I put on this huge like ski suit and all this stuff at water I'm like, like, in case I have to walk it out or mm-hmm. whatever. Really dumb. So this is about 10 miles away. I go on the North side. So I'm driving up and I said, okay, all the highways are closed they're frozen over. So I had to kind of navigate under and I figured out this path. So I drive up, all of the lights were out. So I'm driving out. I'm like, okay, first of all, all the lights are out. Like that's kind of a thing. Okay. First abandoned car, second abandoned car in the middle of the street. Okay. That was kind of weird. First apartment building on fire, second apartment building on fire. This is true story. And I'm driving up going, okay, maybe again, my wife was right. I shouldn't have gone and done this. And I turn on the radio and I start going to across the dial. Half the radio stations were off the air because they ran out of diesel. And that was the moment that I was like, okay, this is, this is different. You know, it's like, this is like kind of spooky. And, uh, I get there building still intact. House is still intact. Kind of dumb to go out there for visit for buildings, but it was crazy. The disruption, basically nobody was traveling. That was day three. So I don't think we have the capacity to, to withstand day five. I remember, and if you remember like that weekend, 70 degrees in Austin or San, San Antonio was yeah. like, uh, like below freezing for five days. And then like, you know, balmy on Saturday, but like that was really a close call. You know, I, I remember we did a postmortem with, I don't know, maybe four or five guys. They were, I don't, I only knew some of them, but they're all, I wouldn't call preppers exactly, but people who think about these yeah. kinds of things, you yeah. know, who, who have things in their house and they got a flashlight and, you yeah. know, care about this kind of thing. And, um, and we're all like, how did we all do so badly? badly. Yeah. I mean, all of us, I mean, for different, and, it, and the other thing that was interesting is that all of us had totally different experiences. Mm. It wasn't like we were all like sitting in there shivering. Uh, like that was somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some were, some were almost like lost their kids. And then yeah. others were like, 
I mean, like my, I had to evac and I went to like a, some resort or something cause they had power and like, mm. you know, it was like everyone had totally different experiences. Um, and I think, I think that was pretty eye opening and, and really it came down to none of us were paying attention to the weather mm. cause if any of us had, we would have taken some preventative measures. I, what I tell people now, uh, as I say, go to, I think it's readiness.gov or whatever the DHS site is for natural disasters and have that have 30 days of food or 30 days of something. I also got, I think I got this idea from Dan too, Dan Cornell, um, this water tub thing. It's like you go to Amazon for 20 bucks, get this huge bladder that you could fill up with fresh water. I was like, okay, I got that. That's cool. And just like flashlights and stuff. And I got kids. So, I mean, like, like stakes are higher when you have a family. Uh, sure. And, but it's interesting. Uh, you know, all these things you don't think about. And I did, I mean, I, I, in the worst kind of weird time of the, uh, the run up to the Ukraine war, I mean, like, like there was a lot of, you know, rhetoric from Putin about nuclear war and all. I mean, it was pretty brazen April ish of uh, two years ago. I live in San Antonio. It's like military city USA. I mean, like, like, of course it's a target. So the one weird thing that I'm embarrassed I said I did is I went out and bought a lot of liquor uh, to trade for ammo. <laughs> so I still have it. I still have it. I'm not. A, I'm. I'm not a big drinker. I'm trying to be. Uh, that's on my list of uh-huh, to do's. But uh-huh. like, I, I, I still have it. I was like, hey, what? Nobody's gonna have cash or gold. They don't know. Like, hey, how about liquor for ammo? I mean, so I, I think, did do that. I think every major city is a target. So I yeah. don't think. I don't think any one of them's gonna get out unscathed if that were to be the be the case. Okay. So, but uh, next year's the election time. <laughs> Um, what do you, what do you think about that one? Can I just like, am I allowed to pass on a, a yeah, question? You could. No, 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 no. You I, could, but I, but, um, I th- but I think this actually dovetails into the bigger conversation because if, if you're going to attack the United States during a transition of power, that's a, that's even, I mean, I think I read every book on information operations, um, prior to and after the 2016 election and since I've read a bunch of them. Um, and remember, KG, uh, uh, Putin was uh, KGB in charge, charge, in charge of the directorate responsible for information operations, which is psychological warfare and all that. And um, I would say that that was a brilliant, brilliant campaign in 2016. Whether or not it affected the outcome, we'll never know, right? And that's one of the axioms of, of information operations is you throw it out there and you really can never measure or really quantify what the effect was that's the bad thing you know uh about them is you throw them out there and did it have an effect uh, we don't know and the classic example was uh the fact that aids was you know the, the the kgb thing in the 80s that aids was a function of a lab deal from the u.s injected in africa that was a total kgb operation uh, we did one during uh, Desert Storm, which is, we call it psychological operations, psychological warfare. It's actually quite cool where we, um, true story, we translated every like World War II Marine movie to Arabic and had it out, out there showing all these, you know. And then, um, so what do the Marines do, right? You know, they, they, of course, they land coming ashore, like in Saipan and Iwo Jima and all these mm-hmm. different things. So during Desert Storm, we landed them and had them come around. They were in a task force that came all the way around and did an end around and didn't attack from the sea. And they had several divisions, Iraqi divisions, facing out to the to the sea because they pretty much bid on that. Uh, the irony of all this, and I've heard this, I've, I've, I've read it and heard it, is that apparently that was Schwarzkopf's idea or some of his staff. The people that opposed that idea were the Marines because guess what the Marines do? So they they, go, they, they want to go in straight. They come, they come ashore. <laughs> so it's like, wait, we're not going to go to the back door. But the point being is that was a successful example of a information operation. There's others, but when you lay them out there, I think the one you can't quantify is uh, the political election stuff. The, 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 the truth is I'm, I'm pretty sure, I think Gene Spafford threw this out where they found a bunch of Antifa uh, accounts that had le- uh, forgot to take off the geo uh, data. Mm-hmm. And they all were in St. Petersburg. <laughs> so it's mm. like St. Petersburg, Russia, not yes. Florida. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I mean, so like, of course, they add uh, fuel to the fire. I mean, there are certain divisions. They're completely uh, obvious to the outsider. And they've gotten worse. So what they do is they add fuel to the fire, most certainly. And 
I don't under I can't imagine a world where they're not involved and I don't know what that means. I mean it's it is it's not good, you know. And it's funny that the Chinese don't do it. It's just the Russians who are still butthurt about the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you lost. Yeah, they did lose. Move, move on. Yeah. So we're back with a vengeance. Yeah. All right. So what's what's next for you? What are you uh, what are you gonna do in your non? Oh, that's a tough, tough question. Tough I mean, question. What do you, you want to do? Ah, uh, eyeing, eyeing any new companies you want to start or anything like that? Or? I am. I've through process of elimination figured out what I'm not gonna do this year. Okay. You know, and and uh, <laughs> I said the plaintiff's attorney one was one. I actually have a friend up here in Austin that wanted me to help him during the session as a lobbyist. Uh -huh. I didn't do that. Uh, keynote speaker. Uh, you, you would have been good at it. Uh, uh, yeah, but I, he wanted, he wanted me up here all the time. And I was like, I don't want to go to uh, do that trek up I 35, like once sure. a day, uh, time to of, move to Austin. Uh, <laughs> I've come close a couple of times, <laughs> by the way, uh, now that I've got a family in San Antonio, it's not going to happen. But, um, I would say the thing is, uh, what I'm, I'm looking at right now is I've got a bunch of interested people that are looking at doing a new project. Uh, and it, it is going to be AI related and have AppSec through it. And that's. I'm kind of in skunk work mode or, you know, stealth mode right now. Uh, but I think that the, as, as for all the reasons we just talked about, like it's almost too hard not to, I mean, it's too, too much of a opportunity both to help and to do so in a way that's, you know, keeps people employed. And by the way, keeping people employed, doing what they like and enjoy and helping society is quite a good thing. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing wrong, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm, that's kind of where I'm at and right we now. We might need a lot more of it. Soon. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, mentoring people, growing some of these folks that I've seen, I mean, one, uh, you know, Kyle Hankins was on the, the, the previous show mentioned Priya who helped, uh, author the LLO LLM top 10. I was like, I mean, it's cool. That's super cool. And there's for, there's a ton of them out there that, uh, that are like, okay, I, I think we can have some, you know, a lot of impact for the next generation and all that stuff. So yeah, that's where I'm at. It's actually those groups of people you, you named a couple, but there's, there's a handful out there that I'm, I, give me some hope that we actually can get in front of this problem a little bit better Yeah, because man, it is going so fast and I see so much garbage being put out like, Whoa, like that too. How are we going to get in front of all of this? Like this is just, it's just, a, it's just mounting and mounting and mounting and AI producing its own code now. Like, Oh, like that isn't none of that code is good. That's all like LLM on top of Stack Overflow, and that was not good code to begin with. And you know, just, just no. I mean, it, it's um, yeah. I, I I think I think there's so much out there to do. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not absolutely. a great answer, but no. Uh, okay, so what do you what do you think uh, CISOs are gonna need to know coming up here in the next uh, handful of years? What's what's the new hotness other than the AI, obviously. That's also a good question. Um, I I would say, AI aside, I would say go back to the conversation about the nation state threats. I I do believe um, that this is a trickier world, and that scenario is never included in most organizational planning. Uh, the lack of power. I would throw in uh, internet disruptions, mm -hmm. uh, GPS disruptions. And uh, I would also point to the Air Force and Navy in the West Coast at Nellis and in uh, California training in GPS-deprived environments. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, uh, but I've heard we're much <clears throat> better at this than the Russians. Um, I think, so. uh, well, we raised a couple of generations of aviators that, that really use GPS uh, mostly. And the thought being is if it's not ubiquitous, if it's denied either by jamming or worse yet by anti-satellite stuff, that can we still fly, fight, and win, to use the Air Force term? Um, they are most aware of that. And uh, so I see the Air Force training. There, there's FAA notums, notice to airmen, that when they do these training exercises, so it's public that it's not, you know, that it's, it's, it, they're doing it for a reason. Uh, again, I would point to Ukraine. I would point to Gaza as examples of, one or the other side weaponizing internet, weaponizing power, weaponizing GPS access. Uh, so I guess what I would tell CISOs is this is a trickier world and your BCPDR plans and in general resilience plans 
should include those type of nation state threat what, thoughts. What about supply chain in general? Like just physically moving pr- your product around the world or your yeah. or your supply, you know, the things you need to build your parts I mean, for your trickier. whatever. Trickier. I mean, like way trickier. I mean, I mean, I mentioned the NSA warning for PRC, but like, okay, you're offshoring everything to Vietnam from China. Okay, great. How are they going to get it here? You know, look at the map. I mean, unless they ship it all the way around the globe the other way, it's going through, you know, like right by the Spratleys, right by Heinen Island. Uh, so I think that that the acute awareness of supply chain risk, uh, and I, I was talking at Black Hat two years ago to one of the uh, hardware vendors, I won't name the name, and sure enough, like everything they build is in Taiwan. I'm like, what's your plan B? Like, we don't have a plan B. And I, I'm willing to bet two years later they probably have a plan B uh, near shoring or something because, I mean, disruption. And it, it may not be an invasion of Taiwan. It could just be all kinds of dis- disruption where, um, I mean, what if they do a no-fly zone, you know, or a blockade or, you know, like mm-hmm. there could be a lot of different ways that that happens and plays out. But I think supply chain stuff Geopolitical risk is becoming prominent in the investor discussion. So, or, or, or piracy. I mean, piracy in in situations like this, piracy does kind of pop up. Yeah, I mean, and I would as state, a, and it could be state sponsored piracy as well, which is a different um, kind of thing. I mean, I, I'm not gonna. I mean, the Navy guys know this better than anybody. Straight, you know, uh, and particularly Houthi rebels and kind of that part of the world, Somalia and all that. Uh, but. I, I've always felt that that's been kind of a nuisance more than anything else. That that's not probably fair. <clears throat> but yeah, but but if the United States has to pull back because of you know there's a lot of political pressure to do so, let's say from coming from within within the United States, like we're losing carriers, let's say, and we have to pull out of those regions just from you know just because we don't really want to keep losing men and equipment. Yeah. Who's going to protect those regions? Oh, they're they're on their own. <laughs> That's uh, so. Uh, there is a book, another book I read. It's I think it's under the heavens about the Middle Kingdom, about China historically, and the truth is, is they were they've been a very powerful regional country for two thousand years. Really, the last eighteen hundreds was really an aberration, right? And their claims on that region have been historical and long term. Uh, essentially Vietnam and South and Korea were vassal states as were other pl- parts where they paid homage in, in exchange some, for some political protection and great trade, uh, you know, trade uh, uh, deals or whatever. So like when you read stories about the South China sea and then South of that, you know, the Spratleys and you re- you find a story about a Chinese junk that their uh, archeological, archeological, logical, experts have found they are doing that as much for historical purposes uh, as they are to make a a claim regional claim and that book was fantastic about the truth is that they were the power forever and they predated most of the western world and were much more sophisticated the western world 1800s were an aberration this is that in their view and, and there's some truth to this they have reascended to their role well as long as it's not the the guys that are forcing, you know, hegemony are for forcing, you know, the vassal states to like Korea and others to. I mean, look at the, this week right now, the Philippine Navy is having a, you know, a back and forth deal with the Chinese about those islands. So it's like, you know, the regional claims are off the charts. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not great. <laughs> it's mm. like, uh, so I, I just think CEOs and sizzles on this side should probably spend a little bit more time Disaster recovery. I mean, like, like I, I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm speaking to a bunch of data center people in January about this time. You know, here's the questions you should ask your electrical providers. You ask so many invasive questions to your supply chain providers, your consultants. That's not where the risk is. The risk is probably more with those guys, given the world that we live in. Hmm. I mean, if we have another winter outage in Texas again in this grid, look out. A second one. You know, was it? Third. Third. Yeah. This would be the third. Okay. So there yeah. was the, there was the st- storm again and ice again or yeah. whatever. I, they had some crazy names for them. Yeah. Um, the ice storm was the second one. And that was, I think the worst of the two, if memory serves. Um, 
kind of but i mean it's a, a thing of topic at the legislature in austin in most cities and most uh so i don't know it'll be interesting to see but um uh, yeah fun stuff hmm. well that's all very terrifying um so let's uh let's talk about um uh, where people can find you and like how they get in touch with you what do you Wow. Uh, not my phone any, number. Anything you want yeah. to promote? Uh, no, I was going to say if they want to call John Dixon, they can call John <laughs> Dixon from Colonial Pipeline. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, I would say probably my uh, Twitter handle, at John B. Dixon, is the best way. Follow me or DM me. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, email is john at johnbdixon.com. Great. You know, so that's probably the easiest way. And no phone number. You don't want them calling you in the middle of the night or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I mean, I can give it out because I have that setting now that, that so you can't get a hold of me if it's uh, not uh, whatever. Yeah. No, p- p- please no. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for driving up. I really appreciate no, it. No, man, it was my, a lot of my fun. pleasure. I'm I'm just happy I can drive back knowing I can call myself a hacker now. Yeah, you can, <laughs> and you can listen to EDM the entire EDM way. the whole way. All right, uh, and next and next week when you finally get around to talking to your wife about this, uh, you let me know how that goes. I'll let you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, my pleasure, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.